why don't we open the meeting here? Uh, planning board meeting for March 26th of 2021. Uh, we are conducting this via Zoom per the governor's orders. Um, it is being recorded. If anybody else is recording, that is fine. You just need to let us know. Okay. Um, I am going to ask if um, uh, whoever's not a board member on here could just go into the chat and sign in. Um, that would be great. So we could have a sign in sheet uh, for who is here. Um, all right, seven o'clock town planners report. Alan. Yeah, this is starting to get busy. Everyone's biting at the bullet with warm weather. Uh, I talked to Scott Lamont from 22 Tannery Road in regards to he wants to revise his parking. And at the same time, he's going to be filing, he's going to do, be doing a modification to the special permit. And depending on his parking, he may have to apply for a stormwater permit also. Um, likewise, I talked to Craig Samuelson of 320 College Highway in regards to a proposed self storage also along uh, Industrial Road. He, um, he has a um, site plan. Um, that was already approved. And now he wants to add on to that along the industrial road going towards the landfill. Um, I, I talked to a proposed owner of lot number five on Rising Corner Road uh, regarding the setbacks in the R40 zone. It's kind of unique about the parcel. It's split half and half. Half is in Selfwick and the other half is in Agawam but the uh, building inspectors are going, to be, are, are going to work that out. We received notification from the Springfield Registry of Deeds. Every year, they always ask for a copy of the signature page for the planning board, which Megan has, um, has prepared, and we just have to sign it. They want to make sure that the plans that are coming in with the necessary signatures match what's, what's, what we're putting on this um, sign-in sheet. Um, the, the owner of 767, who was an interested, he's going to be putting in his self-storage building. He's inquiring of buying some additional land to the rear of him, but it's a, he's in a BR zone, so he can use his um, self-storage. Behind him, it's an R40, so it would require a zone, chart, a zone change. So I told him how you know, it's a lengthy process. And it could take over a year because it, it would again, again have to go to um, you know public hearings. Um, Megan and I helped prepare preliminary warrant articles for the annual town meeting. They're just preliminary. We know they're going to be changed. Uh, I've, I've also received additional questions on the Griffin Land Trust land off of College Highway, and they may. They may be coming in as early as the beginning of April with um, a special permit and the uh, site plan approval. There's still some things that they have to work out technically with the town, uh, but they would like to get on the docket and get part of it, part of it approved without um, the water, for an example, maybe the need for a, a, a stoplight, but a so they'll be coming in shortly. And both Michael and I attended the Zoom meetings for our capital budget regarding the proposed master plan we've been trying to get through. And then we also attended the opera, you know, the financial committee uh, for our oper operating budget. So we're still waiting to hear, you know, what the outlook is for that. And that's it for right now. <clears throat> Okay. Um, we're not doing the master plan ourselves yet. Are we waiting still? All right. We're not going to do the master plan survey ourselves. No, we're not going to do ourselves. Okay. <laughs> um, um, 705, uh, public comment. Anybody have anything that they wish to bring to the planning board's attention that is not on the agenda for tonight. Okay. 
So let's go to the, uh, let's see, yep, 710, uh, solar bylaw public hearing. Let me just grab the notice here. All right. Uh, notice is hereby given in accordance with the provision of Mass General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 11, that the Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, March 16th, 2021, at 7 10 p.m. via Zoom on an application by the Southwick Planning Board to amend the Town of Southwick bylaws. The planning board proposes to amend chapter 185-23.2, small scale and large scale ground mounted photovoltaic systems and any related tables to allow large scale ground mounted photovoltaic systems in residential zones when certain criteria are met. Uh, Zoom information is provided. A copy of the application and the plans may be inspected by contacting the town planner, Alan Slessler at 413. 3569-6056 or at his email address. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and manner designated Michael Doherty Chairperson Southwick Planning Board. Okay. Um, do we, we have everybody, okay. Let's make sure everybody's still on here. Wait, Michael, do you, have, do you have a copy of the um, proposed warrant article? Because with that, there's a chart which Marcus and I sort of uh, ran through that you yep. could share with the people. And they give me one minute to pull that up here. You still want us going directly to you first, correct? For, especially for bylaws. Uh, what does that mean? Well, rather, you know, uh, rather than sending a lot of information to all the other board members. Oh. Everything, everything does funnel back to, um, to Megan. Right, but we just have to, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's somewhat of a gray area, but, you know, when you're sending emails to all the board members, um, if it's not simply just, a, you know, something from Megan, here's a document, um, if there's comments or if whatever, if it's going to all the board members, arguably that is an open meeting law violation. And so, you know, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're doing it by the book as much as we can. Um, it makes it a little more uh, labor intensive at the hearing or at the meeting. Um, but, I, you know, I just you really can't be sending other than sort of the initial thing. And I think it's probably best practices to BCC everybody rather than actually, um, you know, send it directly to them. That way, if they hit reply all, it's not going to everybody, um, you know, but I think to some degree, Megan's gotta be the sort of collector of information. And then we sort of deal with it at the, at the meeting. Okay. All right. Um, all right, give me one second. Let me just pull up. So, uh, Michael, in that regard, I've been sending things to Megan, but I guess the appropriate thing for her to do is take off my uh, email and then just send it out from her as an attachment rather than just forwarding my email. I mean, here's what I would say, right? Um, if people are sending out an original sort of working copy of something, whether it's minutes, whether it's a written decision, whatever it is, if it's just the original draft of it, you know, for people to look at and review and offer comments, uh, that's fine. I, mean, I don't care. Just have, just send it out, have, just have Megan send it out, whatever it is. Like I said, I, I think it's best practices to do it by BCC. That way you're, someone's not accidentally replying to everybody with their comment. Um, but when you start to get into successive drafts um, and people's input, that's when you start to get into it having a problem, right? Because that's arguably one board member offering their opinion about something to all the other board members outside of a public meeting. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's dumb and it's a pain in the butt, um, but I think it kind of has to be done 
you know, that way to the best of our ability. Um, I don't care about little, you know, I, I'm not going to, uh, if you have little typos or grammatical corrections or things like that, that are just being circulated uh, to me, that's, it's just easier to get that done beforehand and it's not substantive and I don't really care. Um, but you know, if it's something substantive, if it's your comment on something, your opinion about something, I would, I would try to, you know, keep that, uh, keep that to the, you know, bring it up at the meeting or if something needs to go to Megan, uh, send it to Megan so that she has access to it or, you know, whatever. So the key is the board members should not be commenting back on any material that's been sent to them. Yes. Other than the minutes, I guess. And the only comment on the minutes goes back to Megan. And even, you know, if it's, if it's non-substantive, if it's just corrections like that, I don't really care. Right. On the minutes, I, like I said, I don't, that to me is, it's much more efficient to do it that way. Um, but and I don't think it's, I don't, you know, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but I don't think it's an open meeting violation if you are just making corrections to grammar or typos. Um, it's when you have a substantive opinion or comment on something that I think it becomes an issue. So, um, all right, let me, Marcus, since you're this one who sort of were coming up with the structure of this, let me just, um, I just want to pull up what, uh, let's see. All right, here's your table. That's what you want me to pull up, right, Marcus, the table? Right. Uh, I think yeah, that's what Alan and I had, Alan had suggested originally, and then uh, we changed it slightly, but not too much. We added the R20 zone and uh, just quickly looking at R20, uh, there are very few properties in the R20 zone that are over 20 acres, uh, possibly a couple east of Sheep Pasture Road, some of the tobacco land. But other than that, it's, it's uh, small lots and they're occupied by, mostly occupied by uh, houses already. So, yes, the key thing is the column that's R20, R40. That's a new column inserted into this table one. And you see if it's small scale, it requires a site plan review just like the other zones. If it's large scale, it requires a special permit and site plan approval. And then there's a footnote that says on a minimum of 20 acres. So I think we had talked about acreage size uh, and seemed to think that 20 acres was a uh, minimum size in order to put in a large scale ground mounted system in uh, any of those zones where you see it's allowed by special permit and a site plan approval. So that was a straightforward uh, way of allowing solar in the residential zones. And I think you were gonna look at improving the language as far as uh, screening and so forth, because right now there is some language in there. The setback required is 50 feet. And I think that's about it. So the key here, or the main thing is, is this table. Okay. Um, yeah, the length, uh, hold on, there's a pull up here. Basically, in our bylaw, Michael, now there are there is reference to screening and plantings, and um, you know the board has uh, under our direction they can require more if it's built 
you know, if it's in an area that doesn't have a lot of trees. And also there's a lot of specifications as far as what the engineering for the um, proposed solar has to do and all of the regulations are, are for that. So I would think it, I think we've got it covered and we've used it for our existing three of them that we have now and it's worked quite well. So, um, yeah, here's, um, I meant to send this around and I just, and I apologize because I didn't, but we can look at it here and I'll send it around and I suspect we're gonna continue this on to the next meeting anyways, but um, uh, hold on, let me pull up. Stop that. So the, there's two, there's two um, decent set of guidelines, if you will, out there. Um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission puts one out um, and uh, as well as the Commonwealth. And so let me show you um, and I'll send this doc, those two documents around, but let me just pull up. So here is, um, this one is the Pioneer Valley planning. Um, the whole thing is, you know, 183 pages. Um, and I expect everybody to have read it, you know, by the next meeting. No, it's, there's certain sections. I mean, a lot of it, frankly, you know, when they, I'm assuming they use, if it's not this, then, then something similar, an original iteration of, of this type of guidance when they were drafting the bylaw to begin with. Um, but, you know, this is sort of their new version and it has some proposed language. Um, you know, the, the thing for me is, you know, right now we have it structured where you can just go build something and throw some, you know, arborvitae or whatever um, in front of it, right? And you have, I don't forget, it's five years or something like that to, to get them full growth and, and blocking the thing. Um, and, you know, it's successful sometimes. Um, Kangamon, probably not a ideal example, but uh, that was I think, boy, these bylaws anyways. Um, but their screening is not the best. But, you know, I don't really envision on properties in the residential zone that, right? I mean, I sort of envision that you you kind of already have screening, right? You're just, you're, you're maybe putting in an access road to get to an area if you need to. Oh, yes. but, but you really already have full-grown natural uh, screening. I, 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 that's what I'm envisioning, but let me know if people are thinking differently about that. So I think I don't, it's think, you can assume, I don't think you can assume that, Mike. That's the only problem. Well, I'm not assuming it. I think, I think, I guess that's maybe you the wrong be. word if I said that. I, I'm, I am, I am envisioning that's when I would want to let them do it. Right. I, I don't necessarily want something in the residential zone that is screened only by some arborvitaes. I, that doesn't, that's, that start, starts to make me more concerned. Um, you know, if, if, if you have a situation where, you know, you have a huge property and um, you want to put something in sort of the back of the property that, you know, that's, that's perhaps it's farm, you know, uh, farmed area that's already cleared or some kind of opening that you may have or whatever it is. But if you want to put that back there, fine. But I'm not sure having something that would otherwise be visible and throwing some shrubs in front of it is what I envision in the residential zone. Right, we can always make that conditions if it's something that we would, 
you know, where, where are the planning, the planning board is allowed to make those recommendations. And also, you know, just with glancing at this one thing where they also have um, the restrictions of the stormwater management permit, anything disturbed more than one acre there, they have to uh, provide plans showing that there won't be any erosion. There yeah. has to be final ground cover. Yeah, so we wouldn't need I, that. I would, I would think any of the large ones are going to fall under the stormwater management. Right. I mean, I sort of assume that was something that's covered already. We don't need to redo that and put it into this bylaw. We already have, um, you know, coverage for that. Where I suppose where it, where it's going to end up is a different story. But um, we have we have coverage for the stormwater management part of it. Um, Mike, I don't Mike. think we need to take that. Mike. Yeah. Is there, some, is there something inside there so we don't end up with another Kangaman that a uh, foliage needs to be successful? Um, if they put it in and it, and it dies a year later, you can't just leave it? Um, that you have to upgrade it? Um, yes, yes, there is, Dave. And in fact, it's the building official who's responsible for con contacting them. And he has contacted the owner of Kangaman and they said they were going to do something, but they haven't responded as of yet. All right, so there is a provision in there. So down the road, if they, if they're, if their screening fails, there's, there's recourse. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess what I want to know what the board members are thinking as far as the design of it. I mean, I, I take Alan's point, but I don't. You know, there's a difference between we think we will do the right thing and you know some other board down the line may not think that that's the right thing to do so i mean having it in there as a requirement seems more prudent but um if we're gonna allow this allow this into the residential zone but let me know what other board members are thinking michael we have uh under h3 in the current bylaw yep there's four paragraphs related to landscaping and landscape buffer strip. So that's where if we want to uh, beef it up, add some language, that's where it should go. And maybe based on our experience now to date, we could incorporate, you know, some stronger uh, words, I guess. I don't know. But uh, there is quite a bit... Of, I mean, there's stuff in there now. There's text in there now. And uh, that's what the building inspector and Alan have been using when they talk to the uh, people that are running these systems. So I guess the only thing is if we have a mindset, if this is gonna be in a residential area now, what more has to be added? So you look at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission text and see if there's maybe something new there that uh, will relate to it. I know one of the items uh, actually it's covered again in our current bylaw, H2 talks about land clearing. And that can be sort of a sensitive thing if you're in a residential zone and you start clearing, you know, 30 acres of trees or whatever it's going to get people's attention. So maybe that's a section two that needs to be improved on. And you could say specifically in a residential zone and then talk about what would be allowed as far as clearing. Yeah, I mean, I, that's, I sort of see a few paragraphs there, right? I mean, I see, I see the, the existing you know, paragraphs, and I see one that sort of adds on the criteria for the residential zone um, and makes it a little bit more strict. I mean, I don't... Um, because there are some, there's some language, I think it's in the Blanford bylaw, can't clear more than 50% of a lot or something to that effect. Yep. So there again, we may want to say, in the residential, in a residential zone or in residential zones, uh, give a percentage or something that can't be, you know, cannot be cleared. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, certainly I think, should go in under uh, H2 or an H3. I do like the language. The language is a lot here um, in the uh, Pioneer Valley one about, you know, where removal is planned. You have to demonstrate the removal is necessary and um, would adversely affect the performance of the installation. I mean, I, I think that that's a bit of a... Uh, something that would keep keep um you know removal to be limited it would it, the board could really push on that um i don't necessarily mind this visibility paragraph here um but again i just you know i don't know if it goes far enough for residential uh, also if you put the limitation of the 50, not to clear more than 50%, all of a sudden you have a 20 acre parcel that you'd really have to, if they want a 20 acre solar, they would have to have a 40 acre parcel then. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, I could be, I don't know the Blanford one, um, but I took it to mean um, the area in which you are conducting or, or citing the solar you know, only 50% of that can be newly cleared. Is that how you take it, Marcus, or is that how it's written? Marcus, you're muted. You're on mute. Yeah, you're on mute. There you go. Yeah, I don't recall exactly, and I don't know if it was the, you know, 50%. I just think it's something worthwhile looking at. I mean, it seems silly to, I mean, if you had a, you know, not that it really exists too much, but if you had like an 80 acre parcel and, and half of it was farmland and it was cleared, you're done, right? You can't, you, under that idea, you can't, you couldn't clear anything. You'd have to, um, you couldn't clear a single tree. So I think it's, it, you know, whatever the percentage may be, it doesn't have to be 50%. It could be something different, but, um, you know, I think you look at the area that's being, used one you know it should be cited in a way that is minimizing the amount of clearance and then two in the area of chosen you know there may very well be a percentage that you're limited to as the clearance. Um, and if that results in a smaller array then it has to be a smaller array well that's why marcus was saying it's it's really covered on the h2 and the, and the planning board has the expression of asking, you know, um, to save more or not to save more, as well as the landscape buffers and everything in the screening. You know, those are all conditions that, are, that can be asked for in the decision. Okay. Um... I mean, I know this is the first time looking at it again. I still going back and forth on this whole open meeting law thing and how we're doing it, but I probably should have sent this thing around. But I, do people have any thoughts on this this language just so I can work with this and we can try to, you know, get to more and have some language, you know, some some definitive language for the next one? All, all we're looking at is two and a half paragraphs. Is there? Is this all you're looking at us to look at or? So this is right, vegetation clearing and project visibility. Um, there is, um, you know, again, this would got it, what, in, you know, what was mentioned before about maintenance, you know, we may want to put some language into that about maintenance. So I don't, this is not necessarily what we need, but, um, um, you know, maintaining the vegetation. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, I think some of the things as far as um, environmental factors, what you're allowed to use, things like that, you know, maybe a useful thing to put in there. Um, uh, again, because you're, you are getting permission to use this in a residential zone you know, I don't, I don't know, 
you should be you should be required to sort of give up a little bit of autonomy as to how you handle your land there if you're allowed to put in you know a large scale solar facility there um so i don't really have a huge issue with that but again i you know these first two are really what i was the two things that are are on the forefront of my mind are are clearance and visibility right i mean those are the two things that i'm i'm focused on i don't i think you can minimize how much is cleared and i think you need to you know try to have language that suggests that they should be looking at already cleared areas to put it um but also that really be looking for treed areas mm -hmm. um and you know some of that can be a bit of a a you know, bit of a, a, a push and pull there. I mean, they, they could be opposites, but I do think you want to have existing existing um, screening uh, to the best of your ability. I don't really. I just don't. I'm not sure. I, I'm I'm supporting a amendment that allows throwing up, you know, some shrubs in front of a residential. So, yeah. Mike, why can't we put this like a combination of this together? Um, you know, allowing larger than fifty percent clearing, but leaving enough buffer zone. And I, you know, I'm not quite sure how to word it. Mm -hmm. In other words, clear as much as you need to clear for a solar farm, but leave enough buffer zone to protect the neighbors. Put it as a package together like that versus individually. Say that again, Dick. Instead of doing, you know, the fifty percent land clearing, which um, I agree with Alan, that makes a twenty-acre lot only ten acres. But why can't we take a combination of the percentage of land clearing, let's say, not to exceed eighty percent, for example, and leave enough buffer zone to protect the neighbor type of thing? I, you know, I'm not quite sure how to word that, but just put it all together. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess the one thing I haven't mentioned is the setbacks and I, I don't know if anybody thinks that those should be, um, altered in the residential zone, right? They're, is it 50? Is that what it is? 50 feet. Yeah. I think that's probably, in my thought in the residential zone, that's probably a little light. Yes, I think so too. Especially in residential. Uh -huh. In the commercial zone, no, but in the residential, yes. Yep. So again, so we we basically have, you know, for lack of a better phrase, two paragraphs, right? First paragraph is the general idea, and then we have a, a you know, a more definitive, restrictive paragraph that applies only to residential. Um, what are you thinking for setbacks? I was thinking 100 to 150. Okay. Just to throw numbers out. I mean, I think it's pretty good because you're talking at least 20 acres. You got a good chunk of land here. Yeah. You know? Right. I mean, if you're, yeah. I mean, you're putting in a large solar array, you're going to have at least 20 acres of land. You know, you should be able to have the buffer, you know, some significant buffer. I, I yes. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, the buffer, it's not like it's, it's there for, you know, noise prevention or for you know i mean it's mostly yeah. for um so you don't have to go i don't think ridiculous on but you know i think 100 to 150 something like that even 200 is yeah pretty reasonable um mm -hmm. and accomplishes mm -hmm. once you have that much that distance assuming it is you know again I think with the setbacks, you also have to blend as, you know, probably what Dick was saying before, blend that together, right? You need setbacks that are treed, right? I mean, you need, yeah. mm -hmm. you can't have 200 feet of clearing to your neighbor. Right. Um, so you do need, you need treed uh, screened setbacks. So there probably has to be some overlap there. I don't think there's any way we just put this in black and white. You have X amount of acres, this is what you have to have, period. I think uh, we've got to give ourselves some leeway. Um, 
looking at each situation as it comes up. I mean, you may have, like I say, have a farmer with a big field and he's wide open, or you may have somebody who puts it in the middle of woods. So you just can't put them all in the same plate and say, that's it. I think there's got to be some variables. It has, you have to give the board some, some room to make decisions as to what and where it is. Okay. All right, so um, everybody okay with the way Marcus structured that, you know, table and the 20 acres? Well, first of all, is everybody okay with the 20 acres or are we looking at a different number? I'm good with it. I'm good with 20. Any objection to putting out 20? You're not, you're not, you know, locked in. You can change it when we see the final product next week or two weeks from now, but um 20 seems like a you know everybody seems to be okay with that right now yeah okay yep. all right so i'll use 20 uh we'll keep that the way marcus has that um everybody's okay with that table the way it's structured makes sense yep yep that's yes. fine um and then i will take some of this language about clearing and and uh visibility <laughs> and setbacks and try to, I'm still a little torn as to whether I'm just gonna be putting in separate sentences in different sections or whether I'm gonna be putting in one, you know, paragraph that deals with residential. Um, but let me figure out the best way to do it. And I'm gonna use this, take from this language and send around a sort of draft, um, you know, uh, marked up redlined copy for the bylaw. Michael, I've, I've seen language on the setbacks uh, to the effect front, rear, and side yard setbacks shall be a minimum of a one, <clears throat> 100 feet. So you want to cover front, rear, and side yard setbacks shall be a minimum of 100 feet. In other words, Sometimes setbacks are different, whether it's the front or the side. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the language that I've seen in a bylaw says all of them should be a minimum of 100 feet. I mean, is there, I guess I would, you know, there's, I think the likelihood of the front one having any real meaning is minimal. Um, I suspect these are things that are going to be toward the rear and, and side of people's properties um, for the most part. Um, is there any? Well, it could be it could be a standalone just on a property without a well, no, it would have to have a residence. You're right. So well, it would be probably behind a residence. I think Residences are uh, what seventy five feet front seventy five feet for the front. Yeah, I mean, I you know you could have <clears throat> how your acreage is set up, but um, it, you know your acreage could go sort of left to right as opposed to you know front to back, and so you could have a large side area where you could be putting it. So it may come up to the front there, but I suspect for the most part we're dealing with the, the rear and the side setbacks. But is there any? Is there any desire to have certain setbacks um, larger than other ones? Can't think of a reason to do that. Okay. Yeah, on the Congamon Road, when Mike, what we did is we treated it as a um, more like an estate lot. We had a minimum of seventy-five feet side, sides, front, and rear. And that's what that's what's in the, and you know even though we have this design standards, we can require, we can actually require what we do want. Okay. Um, I'm more concerned with the density of the buffer right. versus the amount of distance of a setback. Right. You know, you could have 150 feet oh, setback from cool. one yard to the other, but if only 10 total feet of that is thick vegetation, it's not it could be 50 feet distance doesn't really make much of a difference. Right. Yeah. No, I agree. No, I mean, agree. Agree. 
yep. if Tangamon had, you know, thick vegetation in front of it, no one would care, right? Right. It's it's so mm -hmm. far away, it doesn't, but it's wide open view. Okay. You know, if somebody, when it comes to things like the front setback and stuff like that, you know, you could have a neighbor across the street from you who would care what your front setback was, but I wouldn't care if there was 150 feet. I'd be more concerned that there'd be 50 solid feet of trees and brush and a burn to create the actual visual buffer, not as opposed to exactly how far away it is. Let me work yeah. on maybe I'll, maybe I'll just Maybe I will really focus and tweak from this uh, the visibility, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. if you, you know, it, and maybe it's if you have residential properties next to you, and presumably you, you do for most of these, um, if you have residential properties next to you, you they sh it shouldn't be visible to them. Yeah. Right. Yeah, when I said 100 to 150 feet, I was thinking that was the thickness of the vegetation, not the... Right, not the setback itself. but the Not the setback itself. That was how, how thick of a, mm. yeah, whatever you want, a wooded area, whatever you want to call it. So All right, you're 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 going to be changing under design standards G one. Oh. You're going to need to remove, um, you know, talking about these zoning districts. You're just going to come up with the standard side yards and re and remove what we already have, or make a modification to G one. I think I'm going to. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm almost wondering whether, you know, as we're talking about this here, whether more broadly a, a, a paragraph or a sentence that talks about, you know, if you abut a if you abut a residential property, you know, I don't care what zone you're in, you, there shouldn't be any visibility, right? I mean, that's I think that's a pretty basic standard. Um, that you should be looking for, but um, I don't, I, Alan. I the answer is I don't know uh, location of where I'm going to put it in the bylaw yet. I just need to sit down with it and see which which looks better and which makes more sense. Okay. Um, but I'll try to um, send that around shortly. I'm actually uh, I should have. Plenty of time. I'm, my kids are out of school the next two weeks or this week and next week, so uh, I'll be around and have some time. Well, I think with with G one, it focuses on the the requirements in the chart, right, Alan? That's for like the setbacks. Yes, uh, it does. So we could we you technically we could leave that alone if we're happy with just when it comes to technical setbacks, we're okay with what we have for the zone but when it comes to this it's we're not we're necessarily worrying about the setback when we're talking about the buffer if we really want to beef up the language instead of trying to find a good number for the setback that might work for all these different properties let's just focus on increasing our buffer and our vegetative blocking yeah we're we messing we with the numbers we of the setbacks we need to make sure it doesn't conflict with the current language under G1. Because the last sentence says, in cases where the parcel abuts agricultural zones, residential zones, parkland, or conservation land, the setback shall be a minimum of 50 feet unless waived by the planning board. So as the other parts are being worked on, uh, you know, we need to watch that we don't end up having a conflict yep. in the text. Yep, and no, that's, Agreed. I mean, maybe we just take out residential out of there and, and, and deal with both, you know, the residential zone as well as properties that abut residential zones in a, in a different section. Um, but let me just see, let me play around with it and I'll mm -hmm. send something around because I just, I, I have to visualize it. Um, and I, as I, cause I can't, I can't decide which is gonna work better as I'm sitting here. Um, all right. Anybody, anything else with the, uh, solar? Well, now you, you're going to let other folks comment, right? I don't know yeah. if, uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission <laughs> has someone on this meeting. I had communicated with them. Uh, they did, I don't think provide any comments, but 
I have one short comment from them, which I'll mention at the end here. All right, that's fine. And I and, and I was uh, quick with what I said. I meant I meant from the board. Is there any other anything else from for the solar bylaw from the board? Are you going to open it to the public? I am. Michael? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to first do town officials. If any town officials have any comments, um, hop on here. Let me stop the share here for a minute. I can see better. All right, any town officials? Okay, uh, public comments. Anybody in the public have any um, uh, comment on the proposed solar bylaw and the criteria for uh, large scale arrays in the residential district? Okay. Um, so why don't we, um, right here Michael, I just, Michael, there's just okay, one on short short yep, go comment ahead. from uh, Catherine Rate at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Okay. Uh, I was hoping they would look over our current bylaw and sort of give us some feedback as it relates to the green communities designation. So she sent a very brief email that just said, I think for the green community certification that it makes sense for the town to certify the fact that research and development related to clean energy is allowed by right, given the time crunch, whatever that means, time crunch. I don't but know. I guess, uh, uh, I don't know if there's anything in the solar bylaw related to uh, research and development for clean energy, or if there is another bylaw in the town that relates to that. But she's uh, saying that there ha there should be a by right use somewhere. Um, so two things. Um, um, one is, um, you know, I I, I want to keep this somewhat focused on you know, these large residential properties and for large arrays only because, um, you know, Jessica brought up to me the other day, a good point, which is whether, you know, thinking about sort of adding in a middle category may be a, a useful exercise. Um, you know, this has been, the solar bylaw has been around for a little while now. Um, you know, technology has certainly improved and, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, that thousand square foot number, you know, maybe nothing that could be revisited and you could also possibly revisit, you know, it, if you allow something between, you know, a thousand or whatever that number is and, you know, something higher, you know, have that sort of middle ground um, where you are going to allow ground mounted in some cases, because there's certainly, you know, whether it's residences or, or um, uh, other properties that, you know, may need more than a thousand square feet and uh, are not going to be running a commercial, you know, enterprise of selling it back to Eversource, but they just need more than what we currently offer. Um, so I, you know, I, I do wonder whether that's worth discussion, but I think that may be a later point and we can deal with green community stuff later on. But, you know, on the limited stuff that I've read on the green communities, I think our bylaw complies with it. I mean, I think we have sufficient, I thought we did because we have, my understanding was that if you can require a site plan review, um, you don't have to do it by right and, and, and be building permit only. You can do a site plan review, which is what we do um, for, you know, two categories of the smaller arrays. I think that that's sufficient, but I could be wrong. Um, well, Michael, it could be something as similar. What they're saying by right is the town is allowing areas to have solar. It's similar to like our medic, medical, our marijuana, you know, it's, it's required by right. And we have, we do have areas that they are allowed to put it in. I think what, what, Pioneer Valley might be approaching is municipalities themselves should be looking to possibly put in their own solar sites to, I'll just make it up for an example, to power 
the police station, the fire department, schools possibly. And, yeah, um, I don't know enough about that. I just, when I, what little I've read on the green community designation, you have to have uh, at least one category that is by right. And I believe we have that for all the small scale systems. I mean, I, they're all by right. They're just, they just require a site. So again, right. you know, I know just enough to be dangerous. So I could be hundred percent wrong and Doug is raising his hand. So I'm going to call on Doug and let him offer his opinion because he knows much more than I do. I've just begun to study this. There's um, Russ Fox is heading up this for the select board, but I think when they talk about by right zoning um, for energy research, you have to allow the use in a zone by right for that. So for example, in certain, every zone we have an allowed use by right, right? In B, it's a bank, in B, in IR, sorry, in BR, it's a bank, in IR, it's book binding. Those were chosen at random. Just to have a valid zone, zoning bylaw, you need to have a by, allowed by right use in that zone. So I think what they're saying is that we would have to have a zoning bylaw amendment to allow research and development for alternative energy by right in a zone to qualify for a green community. So uh, it, that goes a field of the discussion that you're having regarding amending the solar bylaw. I don't know that from what I've read, I don't know that you need to allow solar energy uh, by right. I think it was the R and D for alternative energy by right. But again, no, I haven't studied it extensively, but that was my first read on it. Yeah, no. And I, 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 I think that that section has an or, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's arrays research and development or something, um, rather than an and. And so I, I'm not sure that that, is required, but again, I, that's a different. That's a that's an issue for a down the road that we can deal with. That that's not going to happen now, um, and it's not worth, mm -hmm. you know, throwing something in there. I, I I don't understand her email, frankly, and you know, just because I don't know enough about green communities to really fully understand it. So, right, no, there's going to there's going to be a year or more transitioning going to a green community, and they're and they're going to. Once you become a member of that, you you're told what to do. And I presume if it goes far enough, the select board will approach us, or you know someone will approach us to to discuss what, um, uh, you know what they would suggest for for amendments, and we can deal with it then. Um, you know, and they they'll hold a special town meeting if they need to 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 address what they need to address. All right. Um, anything else on solar? Okay, uh, why don't we, uh, do I hear a motion to continue this to um, March 30th? Why don't we say it's 7-10. Marcus Phelps, so moved. Second. Let's a second. Uh, we'll do a roll call yep. vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Rutzinger, aye. David Sutton, aye. David Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. Okay. Michael, could I just interject something? On um, March the 30th, we have a public hearing scheduled. Correct, Megan? <laughs> what do we do? Uh, what do we have? We have a, we have, um, it's an estate lot, and it's a common driveway, and it's a stormwater management plan, and we have advertised that. Is it for 715, Megan? I got a check, sorry. The one, the 115. 115 Fred Jackson. Fred Jackson. So it's, we actually put it in the paper twice. Okay, so, so why don't we just um, move this, um, you know, those can go reasonably quickly. It depends on what the deal is. Um, it's at 710. It's at 710. So why don't we just put this on for 720? Okay. That way we're not, you know, if it is a short one, we're not, we're not waiting. Got it. All right. Okay. Um, so everybody will just, everybody's in agreement. We'll just alter the motion to reflect 720. Okay. 
Uh, I don't mean to throw snowballs. No, no, no. That's that's. Yeah, I probably should have asked you before we we did it. Um, when I start making up times, that's when we get into trouble. Um, all right. So let's go to the next item on the agenda. Where you might want to get through these a little quicker. Um, signed by law, public hearing, uh, seven fifteen. Uh, notice is hereby given in accordance with the provision of you know, chapter 40A, section 11, that the planning board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, 16th, 2021 at 7.15 p.m. via Zoom on an application by the Southwick Planning Board to amend the Town of Southwick bylaws. The planning board proposes to amend chapter 185-29, signs and any related tables to allow electronic variable message signs to be installed at properties with agricultural retail uses and to adjust restrictions related to electronic variable message signs generally. Uh, Zoom information is provided. A uh, copy of the application and the plans may be inspected by contacting the town planner, Alan Slessler, at 413-569-6056 or his email address. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and manner designated. Michael Doherty, Chairperson, Southwick Planning Board. All right. Um, let me pull up. What was sent around here? Um, oh, here we go. Just give me one minute. It's Microsoft Word is taking a while. <coughs> okay, everybody see this? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, this was Marcus, this was you, correct? My correct. Uh, these are specific changes in a format that would be in a warrant article. Okay. Um, well, let me just start with one um, here. So that's, that's basically it. So, let me make sure everybody can see the whole thing that has changes. All right, so um, the one thing that jumps out to me when I looked at this is um, I'm not, I, I, I sort of conceive this as being for agricultural retail use for lack of a better phrase um, and not just a property that has agricultural use, right? I mean, I, I don't, not that I really foresee there being a meaningful um, difference. I don't think if you just, you know, I mean, it, you could put up a little shack and sell one thing and then you, you are retail, but, and I don't see any non-retail agricultural uses really needing a sign, but at the same time, that's how I have always envisioned this. And that was sort of the initial request was, or initial issue raised was whether agricultural, again, for lack of a better phrase, agricultural retail or retail, I mean, they're basically farm stand type places to some degree, um, but retail facilities in located in the agricultural zone, I guess, may be the way to say it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Michael, what it might be best to do is to, to look at uh, table number six. You can see we did a modification to that. And then that might be a prelude prelude to Marcus's um, recommendations. Well, before we go too far, this under item C, the definitions, all this is doing is adding two definitions 
that aren't in the current bylaw, but these uses are referred to in the bylaw. So all this is doing is adding two new definitions to help people understand when they read those two terms in the bylaw, they understand what we're referring to. They're just definitions. Okay, so then how do you propose to allow um, farm stands to have electronic messaging signs? And that's where we go to Alan's reference table six, which is uh, attachment six colon six in the uh, current bylaw. There's a table, which is in the back. The very last page. No, again, but I, I, I and I, I can pull it up so we can see it. But again, I don't, um, I guess even then, I guess I got to go look at the bylaw to see what agri how agricultural use is being used. I, I, you know, I agree if it's not, if it's, especially if it's capitalized and not defined, it's, that's kind of silly. Um, but. Well, yeah, you can look at that. I mean, if you don't want to put them in, that's fine. I'm just saying that that was a minor correction to put those definitions in. Um, that's not helping. All right, can you see this table here? Mm, or no? No, we're still seeing the okay. uh, suggested text. Yeah, let me... Um, And what we what we did, Michael, is um, through recommendations, we took table six. And if you look at on your left hand side, if you look in at the column number three, and then if you go down to the bottom, the last four blocks, that was grade, which means it was not allowed. And what we're doing now in the residential zones, AC district. And at the top, we can we could possibly put in agricultural above residential. What we're doing is we're allowing those to be in um, a residential zone, and it could be for agricultural also. So okay. by by widening it, it allows those into those zones. And I would recommend putting it at the top at the header where it says business residential zones AC district. And we could probably we could add agricultural. Why are we allowing electronic messaging signs in residential zones? Or and well, Alan, it should say in that whited area that should not have any lines across it. It should say for agricultural use only. So electronic message sign would be allowed in a residential zone or an AC district for agricultural use only. So again, I, I, that's my, that's where I have the issue. So I, again, I, I don't, I mean, I understand that we're dealing with, you know, in part, this is generated by uh, the sign over at Malicious, which I believe is in a residential zone, though you feel free to correct me. Um, no, it is in an R40 zone. And so, you know, but it does have, and it has, and I forget what Joe got, but he can certainly chime in if he wants. But I, I believe it's something from the from the federal government as far as an agricultural, um, you know, use. He's allowed to 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 do that. Um, and I I just agricultural use is not necessarily what I'm for. I mean, I'm I'm thinking retail, right? I'm thinking farm stand type places or, you know, retail that is connected with agriculture, which is what malicious is. Right. Uh, and that's what this is trying to uh, get across. And it's a discussion point for the board, whether or not we want to have this. There's probably 10 locations with possible uh, 
that could possibly use this okay. if we change the bylaw? Well, let's let's just uh, back up for one second, right? Because the way this is being changed, I could put one in my yard. No. Yes, I could. You'd, you'd have to. Not, you'd have to be. You'd have to be an agricultural use. Okay. Well, then if I, I mean, then. So you okay, need so five you, acres to be a farm, right? For the right to farm is over five acres. So that's where it starts. I don't. So I can start a Christmas tree. So, so I can start a Christmas tree farm in my backyard and put a sign on the street in residential sign. Correct. If you were an agricultural use, the way this this is proposed, yes. All right. So yeah. I, I don't. This is what I don't. I don't think it was a smart thing to. Um. Well. What well, Joe is what well, Joe started saying, it was cor is correct. You have to have five acres of a of a producing agricultural use in a residential zone. So I guess I'm, uh, in my mind, the way I look at this is as follows, right? You have res you have two types of, um, you have two types of criteria here in this table. You have zone and districts, right? So you have residential AC, business, uh, whatever. All these right here. Then, you have uses, right? So you have two separate, you have two separate things. You have stuff that's, you know, designated by zone or district and stuff that's de designated by use. Um, I don't see why we should mess around too much with this other than maybe put some phrase in here that says, unless otherwise allowed herein or something like that and then have another category here that says agricultural retail or whatever you want to call it and and deal with it there um because you know i'm a little not you know again i and i'm just sort of you know, obviously I'm not putting a sign in my yard and it's probably not allowed under this if you put agricultural use somewhere up here. Um, but I'm a little hesitant about opening that up. Um, I mean, it certainly has to be more than what's here, right? This, this as edited does not limit electronic messaging signs to agricultural use. Right now, I could put one in my yard under this. So at a minimum, this has to be tailored to write in here on top in the in that heading, residential zones, AC district in which an agricultural use is being conducted or something like that. I'd write it not on the top. I'd write it in that white area on the bottom and, left. And that's fine. I don't what wherever you want to write it. And so I mean, that's that's if the board wants to deal with this at all. I mean that's that's a, you know an open question and. All I'm, all I'm, and Alan are trying to do is to show how uh, it would be accomplished, or how it could be accomplished by, yeah. the, you know, changing the bylaw. I'm trying to figure out how far we are going. Uh, I guess is what I'm trying to do in my head, right? Is to figure out whether we are opening it up to agricultural retail uses or whether we're opening it up to. And, use. and I, again, I don't know if there's a huge difference, but I don't, you know, I don't know if, if. Um, well, maybe the text is for agricultural retail use only. I mean, I guess this is my question, Marcus, right? Can, can Bill Malone put electronic messaging sign in the front of his property? Right. I mean, uh, actually, that's not a good example, but. Why it's a it's he's a in, he's in the BR zone. Fair enough. Okay, let's. let's, let's <laughs> Actually, he's in he's in the B zone. Say, uh, <laughs> the uh, blossoming acres on College Highway. Blossoming <laughs> acres on College Highway. They have a. Sign. I'm it, talking about you know like you know I 
I mean, Bill has that property in the back, right? Where he lets a farmer use the land back there. If that was all residential, if he had just a residential um, or agricultural property and, and he has a house there and he has, you know, farmland in the back, can he put a sign up? Yes, he could. I, to me, that doesn't really, I, I don't know why. Like, why would you allow that? Well, I, I mean, it's a farm stand. It's a farm a use, agricultural use. No, but you know, uh, you understand. it's no. not a farm stand. If you just had a house and no. had a farm in the back, that's not a farm stand. Um, okay. but that's just, why adding the word retail right. might be. That's more why you're saying add retail. I, that's what I, and I just want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're, that's how I conceive of it. That's probably as far as I'm willing to go, but I wanted to see whether people are thinking more because this seems to suggest mm -hmm. something more if we're just using agricultural <laughs> use. And I, I'm not, again, I don't think it plays out where people are just throwing up electronic messaging signs, you know, on their farms uh, if they don't sell anything. But, and I don't even know how many that don't sell anything that are out there. But at the same time, you know, I, I do like to have things that are tailored to what we're allowing and not just have these loopholes put in there just because. Well, Mike, at this right here, the two people down on College Highway, South College Highway, sell Christmas trees and flowers. They can have signs up too. They can have signs I, too, right? I don't have an issue with that. I mean, I, I don't, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure I have an issue with that because they are retail use. There's no reason why that's any different than, than malicious or Calabrese or, you know, Blossoming Acres. I mean, I, I don't, I guess, or Blossoming Acres and the, I don't know, is the, is the, is the farm stand called something different now? Is it still called Putnam's or is it some, something different? Oh, it's uh, now Blossoming Acres. It's across from the campground there and yeah, on the south end of town. Yeah. It changed about 30 years ago, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm myself. Um, well, anyway, I mean, we're that's... Using, we're using oh. examples that are on College Highway or Route 57. The, the idea is that there's also <laughs> ag retail happening on North Loomis and... Uh, more vining, there's right. some properties there that sell honey. So do we want to say ag slash retail use regardless of where that ag retail use happens to be? Um, Black Rabbit wineries or breweries is on North Loomis and right across the street from smaller residential homes. Should they have a flashing or bright lit electronic variable messaging sign on North Loomis and the residential zone? That's what we would be allowing. Forget blossoming acres, forget the guys who already have big signs on College Highway. That's a, what about the other areas? Yeah, and that's, I think that's a fair question. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure I could see an area of town other than 57 and, and College Highway that needs an electronic messaging sign. But they are, but if they're Need or allow, allow. Two different things. Right. Um, yeah, maybe let me phrase it this way. I'm not sure I conceive of an area where um, there would be agricultural use where it would be appropriate to have an electronic messaging sign other than 57 in, in College Highway. I, I just, I'm not sure well, who are we to decide what's appropriate? Uh, I mean, think it's there's only uh, there's Clyde Stables, Silver Crisp Farm, uh, Vining Hill Equestrian Center, Valley Brook Stables, Solek Farm, Pumpkin Valley Farm. Uh, yeah, I guess the other ones would be on College Highway or 57. See, I guess I just think of it as, you know, um, you have a residence, you know, right near College Highway or on College Highway, you sort of know what you've bought into at this point in time, right? I mean, and, and if there's electronic messages and signs that go up, then that's just the nature of the beast because that's is that, where- Is that like a cell tower one up in your neighborhood? It is. It's, it's you know, I mean, it, it I don't, I, I think you have to, look at the actual area, right? College Highway and 57 are much more commercial than, than North Loomis or Vining Hill, right? If you're, if you're buying yeah. near a farm, uh, winery, whatever it is, stable, 
you know, you, you've accepted that that use is there. You're not necessarily expecting an electronic messaging sign there, but um, you know, uh, that's just the way I think about it. I'd be a little bit more hesitant to put electronic messaging signs where there's going to be residents right near there um, who, who probably are not expecting that, or at least not, you know, taking that as a risk when they purchase the property in that location. Michael, just one more thought, like where we have residential zones, AC district, why don't we take that out and put in residential agricultural retail with a minimum of five acres? That sort of touches on the residential, touches that it has to be five acres. That's just, that's just the thought. But Alan, doing that, that does, that does allow places on North Loomis to do it. So, I mean, do you just have a, do you almost do like the middle category and you have agricultural retail use fronting on college highway and feeding? <laughs> That's discriminatory, Mike. How is that discriminatory? <laughs> what happened to the guy? What happened to the farmer on North Longyard? How come I'm a big one on North Lewis? How come he can't do it now? <laughs> you want an electronic messaging sign across from, do you, when you moved into your property, did you have any expectation that there would be potentially electronic messaging signs on your neighbor's properties? No, but there, no, I'm talking about there's a property down on North Loomis. Um, Jessica, what's it called? It's the Black, Black Rabbit, Rabbit Farm. Yeah, it's Black Rabbit Farm. The, At the time, it was just like a ski place years ago, and now person turned to the farm, he's got a business there. So he's got the right, according to your bylaws, to put a sign up, except it's not on College Highway 57. Well, well I, that's, I, only, that's only if we change it to allow yeah, all ag yeah. and retail, regardless of zone. That's if we do that change. Can we allow electronic signage only on? Can we do uh, the business areas of town that are 10, 202, and Route 57? Is that allowed, Doug? I see you nodding yes. I don't know if that's to me. <laughs> or is that discriminatory as Sorry, I was looking at something. I think you guys already have that in this in the sign bylaw already differentiates the downtown business district and and other areas in town. I mean I, I was half paying attention to half doing something else. I mean you got Pat Ayotte's tree farm on Vining Hill Road. I, I don't see him putting up an electronic messaging sign and I don't know that that would be an appropriate sign in the zone, right? there's places where it would work and places where it wouldn't. And I understand where Mr. Dougherty is coming from as far as, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd sign up for one in a, in a, in a, a truly residential zone, but I understand where they might be appropriate in a, in a more highly traveled area. That's not facing homes across the street or something like that. Well, I think if you allow it in enough area, it's not going to be exclusionary. Well, I think that was my point, right? I think you already have it. Your zone, your if I recall, the zone, the sign bylaw has different rules for different areas of town already. That's and, correct. Uh, we're, and, we're now editing the bylaw to allow for yeah, something it, that's already here. Right. And we also have a rule, I think, that uh, just to, to beefing up that argument, there was a heated discussion many years ago about having signs for businesses not on the property in which the business was located. We had a very spirited discussion at the time, I, you know, because a business that was located up the block from a main street wanted to put a sign down on someone else's property advertising their business. And, and basically, I think the discussion was that, you know, the market is going to really drive that a little more than you, you know, your property way off the road had a different value than property on the road for attracting traffic, you know, passing traffic at retail, right? So it was, it was upheld that we could actually hold that, that standard, that, that signs can only advertise businesses on the property in which they're located, except for certain wayfinding signs in the town. All right, well, let's, um, I mean, let me ask this, is, is everybody on board, I guess, with, or at least, um, you know, generally okay with allowing 
electronic messaging signs for agricultural retail use, at least on College Highway and 57? Yes. Do you have objections to that or, or issues with that or specific criteria they would th be thinking about? I don't agree. No, no, I, Dick, I don't mean, I don't mean, do you agree to exclude other properties? That's, that's what I'm trying to figure out is at a minimum, or let me ask you this, let me put it this way. Do people agree as to one of these two things? You either have that you can have electronic messaging signs for agricultural retail use on College Highway in 57 only, or you can have um, electronic messaging signs for agricultural retail use in general. No. You agree with one of those? No. Okay. All right. Um, I think uh, I think the first one you said, Feeding Hills and College Highway, would pass muster with the Attorney General, and it would seem reasonable. I mean, it still could be challenging to to get that uh, approved, but. It, it would seem uh, more reasonable than just opening it up for uh, any residential zone or AC district. All right. Well, let me, um, let's just, let's go on to the next issue so we can, because we can deal with that. Um, and that may be worth a call to town council just to make sure that if we, if we brought that up, um, that's something we could potentially do. I think it is, but I mean, it may be worth clarifying. Um, Let's look at the criteria and, and let me go back to what Marcus had in his. All right. So, um, I mean, the, the display time and sort of what. <laughs> what the effects are, I think are the two bigger issues for most people, but I could be wrong. Um, yeah, this is a middle ground. Uh, hopefully everybody was able to get onto that website, the International Sign Association, signs.org. They have an excellent site. And uh, there's actually a demonstration on there of uh, display times. And the ones they demonstrate are 30 seconds and 10 seconds. Uh, when you look at it, the 30 seconds is quite a long time. And the 10 seconds is fairly quick. So your middle ground would be 15 or 20 seconds. And also taking a look, I just ran a couple samples in town of existing electronic message signs. And there's a formula you use for the distance that you first start to see the sign and the speed limit in that area. And you run it out. And for the signs in Southwick, it's coming out to about 15 seconds that you would want that sign to change. So a person driving by could see a couple of the messages. So there, there you are. And hopefully people have been able to watch the actual uh, demonstration because I think it gives you a, a good perspective on the time. But I put in 20 seconds. And like I said, it could be 15 seconds or 20 seconds. Uh, it's it's kind of up to the board, but it has to be less than 60 minutes. <laughs> All right, um, any comments from board members on these proposed criteria? Well, since we have Doug here, from what I understand, the select board is reviewing the sign at the grist mill and they put certain restrictions on there as far as the time also. Should it be consistent throughout the town? Doug, is it, is it 15 seconds that you guys allowed or is it 20? Uh, I think it was 15 seconds and we adopted the, the, the board of selectmen adopted a policy because the bylaw exempts the town from its own bylaw, but the town, the select board adopted a policy whereby we would follow 
the town bylaw as amended um, subject to the times published, except in a state of emergency. Okay. Thank you. It's gonna do whatever we, whatever we do. And can I ask a question? Marcus, yeah. which signs did you time? Or do you just sign, you timed a couple of them? Uh, let's see, I timed the one uh, at the, uh, the notch. The notch. And, uh, you know, from where you can see it first, either northbound or southbound, and I think that's a 40 mile an hour zone, uh, and malicious, which is a 40 mile an hour zone. And I think you can see it from about 500 feet away. Gotcha. I, I, I did the same exercise with a couple of signs, but I stopped and just counted one Mississippi to, on the times to see what they were doing. Oh, what and they were doing. Yeah. Some were as, and, and I didn't, I did not time the moo and the notch. I, I, there was another one I looked at and it was six seconds. Yeah. Which and that is, seemed to be fire. like, seemed a little fast, but not, it yeah. didn't seem that far off. Right. Yeah. And sometimes it depends. I mean, the one in the center of town at the inn, uh, the speed limit is 35, but when you approach that sign, nobody's doing 35 just because of the traffic congestion and the possibility of getting stopped at that traffic light. So that's a different calculation. So anyway, I, I'm, you know, 15 or 20 seconds, I, I think is reasonable. 20 might, might be too long, but I think it's up to the board at this point and having an opportunity to view that demonstration on the uh, website I referred to. All right, uh, any other board uh, comments on the criteria? I think 20 seconds is okay. Um, one thing that's not here, and I think it'd probably only apply if we were thinking about signs not on College Highway or Feeding Hills Road would be maybe having a, some kind of a thing where they're not on all night long, especially if they're going to be in a semi-residential area. I don't think you want a sign changing every 20 seconds at 3 a.m. out your back door. You know? Dave, we have that in the bylaw. Is it in there? Yeah. And I can't find the reference now. I, have I was it. looking for something. Yeah, it, it says, and actually, I'm sure people are not doing it. The signs are supposed to be turned off, I think, between midnight and 7 a.m. or something. Yeah. Don't quote me on that, but right. we, will. we do have a time in there. Midnight and 6 a.m., unless the business establishment is currently open to the public. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. Um, probably <laughs> still want to look at midnight. I don't know. It might be don't you buy your Christmas trees at 1 a.m.? You know, <laughs> sometimes it depends on how frustrated I am. Not a farm. Yeah. Um, yeah, when no, I crave ice cream, I don't know about you. Yeah, but I can find it without a flashing sign. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess this is going to play into where you put them, right? I mean, it. it trying to think of like the, the the noise ordinance or you know things like yeah. that. What like 10, 10 p.m. I think or nine p.m. something I think like that. So yeah, something like that. I think is a little more reasonable. Yep. You know that may be more what you tie it to um, mm -hmm. if you are going to allow it outside of those two areas. Yeah. Um. All right. Any other comments on criteria? Okay. The other the other items B uh, is you know, improving, I think the text, uh, it adds to the heading color. So it says brightness and color. And uh, it talks about the intensity and so forth. There's already information in that section on uh, the, the uh, intensity or whatever, but this is more or less the glare that it could be caused by some of the colors. And then the sign area and the effects is a whole new section, which gets into what these signs now, these modern 
electronic signs can do. And if you want a demonstration, you just go look at the one at the gristmill plaza right now. But, you know, they flash, they flip around, they move, and they can be very distracting. Um, so that kind of gets at that. You know, I mean, I, I, I had zero problem with any of these criteria. Um, I don't really understand the sign area one, um, top half versus bottom half, to be fair, but uh, I don't, you know, that's fine. Um, I don't really, there, I'm sure there's a reason for it and I just don't know it. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I don't. I was curious about that too. What's the difference between it, whether it's the top half of the sign or bottom half of the sign was that? Well, it's a standard one I've seen in, in several bylaws. Uh, I, I don't know, I guess I'd have to research it some more as to the logic or a sign company person may be able to speak to it. Yeah, that's the only one I mean, that, you know, It I've seems seen. like just by default, that's how people are putting them in. They're on the bottom. Thank you, Joe. I believe that is when I had the kids graduating last year, my signs still work, but down below I had the kids scrolling across the bottom, almost like today's TV when it shows you the actual news down below in the scroll. I believe that's what it means. I believe. Oh, okay. So you, it's the, it's the, okay. Where it says Mike Doherty on your, on your. So the very old. Mm -hmm. The part that's changing is going to be the, the bottom half. Right, which you don't want to change. You want nothing to scroll. It is correct, right. right. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, all right, I get it. All right. Uh, I still don't know why it matters top or bottom, but I do, now I get it. Um, okay. All right, uh, anything else on criteria? All right. Um, Is everybody okay with the putting aside whether you agree with it or not, but just the phraseology? I mean, is is our agricultural retail use? Oh, is that is, anybody have any better suggestions? I don't love it, but it's what comes to mind. Or retail use in an agricultural or retail use. Tied to I an think, I I think think just, five acres. Can people hear me? Yeah, no, the uh, oh, okay. Um, I didn't know if I, I don't know if my mm -hmm. computer went on this Fritz again. Mm -hmm. I mean, the five acres that's that's what's required in order to have a um a gentleman's farmer farm in a, in a residential area. Well, I think we were going towards just having it on Feeding Hills Road or College Highway, the agricultural retail use. And I think Michael was going to try to pull that off somehow or um, put it in uh, some sort of a form. Yeah, but is everybody okay with agricultural retail use or is there better suggestions than that? I like it. I can't think of anything better. All right, and I'll we'll define it. I'll look at. I'll probably take what Marcus has and tweak it um, to sort of tie retail with agriculture. But um, okay, so why don't we? So you're going to you're going to tweak the chart then again. Also, I'm going to tweak the chart and try to put in a um, column for agricultural retail use on. College Highway. Well, I'll put in a, a category for agricultural retail use, and then we can talk about the College Highway 57 thing. Um, but you know, I think I think putting in a column that that deals with that use is probably the way to go. Um, and we can tweak that first column to you know, sort of defer to to the other thing. You know, if it if it's in a retail, if it's in a residential or an agricultural zone. Um, I think, but let me, uh, you know, uh, we'll have something 
solid next time. I think I know where we can, how we can do it. All right, any, um, any town officials or public comments? I'll go under public comment. Um, as far as shutting it off at night, on a personal note, I don't think that's a great idea. Maybe if you made it where it wouldn't move. So from, from the hours of midnight to 6 a.m., it would just be permanent, whether it said Christmas trees at 1 a.m. for Dave or anything, but it was just permanent. Then it looks like a regular standard lit sign because it's not changing every 20 seconds. Just a thought. So we'd have to revise the bylaw that just say it would not change between those hours. I just think it's, you know, we didn't buy the signs to shut them off. You still want to advertise, of course. And I, and I completely understand where you're coming from. So if it was permanent, then it just looks like a sign. It doesn't, it doesn't scroll. So it, it's just a thought. Yeah. I mean, I guess you'd have to change the bylaw. You're right. And it's, it probably depends. You know, it probably depends on whether it's College Highway and 57 or, or elsewhere, right? I right. mean, if, the, the yeah. shell station there is not going to want it to not change, even though he's closed, you know, and that'd be all signs. But our, yeah, our, our time limit is, is on any sort of illumination. So whether right. it's right generated now. by yeah. the sign itself or exteriorly illuminated, it's supposed to be turned off. Which has never happened to mm -hmm. any sign in the town ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, We're very good about following our bylaws in town. Aren't yeah. Oh, yeah. of course. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'll yeah. just shut up. All right. <laughs> but we, while we have this whole thing open, we should take a look at that then. And if there's a you know worthwhile fix, fix so to speak. Uh, putting aside, it. putting aside, if we open this up to non-college highway. 57 areas uh, where residences are involved in a more meaningful way. Um, does anybody have, you know, an argument why we should keep in the turn and turn off the illumination between midnight and six? Hearing none. No, um, as long as we're not flashing. Right, I mean stationary. Um, yep, stationary. Right. You know, constant intensity, whatever. Yep. Yep. We'll find mm -hmm. the language, but okay. Yep. All right. So I'll I will have that in there as well. Um, all right. Any anything else anybody wants to add? All right. Um, why don't we? Um, do I hear a motion to, how about 745, Alan? Will that work? Yes, we have, um, Megan, we have one oh, other oh. thing, but it's not It's not a uh, public hearing. No, are you talking about Samuelson? Yes. He's coming in for a site plan approval. He already has the use already, but it was, it was Samuelson. Um, who, who was going to be put in there. All right. Well, we can try to, you know, maybe try to put him in between the uh, solar and this one, uh, just so we can get him out the door. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. So we'll put this at 745. Do I hear a motion to continue to this hearing to 745 on March 30th? Marcus Phelps, so moved. Mr. Wilson, a second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Singer, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. Okay. All right. So the next one should be very quick. No, I, I expect yeah, right. people are here for this next one. That's the, the, the <laughs> sense that I got on social media is that. Most people are going to be here for this. I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see if Bob Stevens is here because he really he should be here. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, seven thirty. Um, Mike, right, can you clean your screen? Oh, I can. Sorry about that. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, all right, seven thirty. Grandfather term removal public hearing. 
Notice is hereby given in accordance with the provision of Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 11, that the Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, March 16th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m. via Zoom on an application by the Southwick Planning Board to amend the Town of Southwick Bylaws. The Planning Board proposes to amend Chapter 185-36.1, Erosion and Sediment Control for Stormwater Management to remove grandfather from the definition section. Uh, Zoom information Given a copy of the application and the plans may be inspected by contacting the town planner, Alan Slester at 413-569-6056 or his email. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and manner designated Michael Doherty, Chairperson, Southwick Planning Board. Okay. And Michael, again, I prepared uh, the basis of an article. If you want to just look at that and I I try to keep everything simplistic. So this one's pretty easy to do. Yeah, um, I mean, um, just, uh, hold on one second, let me, uh, let me go back to, um, get what I need here. Okay, so, um, let me pull up what Alan mentioned. All right, everybody can see that. Um, okay. So, um, this arose, um, there is a uh, Massachusetts appeals court case that came down last summer. Um, it had a footnote that indicated that, um, that, you know, commonly people use the term grandfather and to refer to, um, um, you know, providing protection for things that existed before laws and regulations came into effect. Um, they decided that they were not going to use the term and they recited in, in brief terms uh, the history of it as a general matter, the origin of it, um, you know, comes from, and I'll read you the footnote, um, it referred to provisions adopted by some states after the Civil War in an effort to disenfranchise African-American voters by requiring voters to pass literary, literary, literacy tests or meet other significant qualifications while exempting from such requirements, those who were descendants of men who were eligible to vote prior to 1867. So that's the sort of origin of the term. Um, you know, it, it, I understand that it has taken on a much more benign um, meaning to most people. I don't think when people use the term that they are being racist in any way, shape or form. Um, but that being said, we are the planning board, we are, um, we are the people who apply the bylaws um, and in that role, um, I think it's appropriate to not formally use the term, especially when a court is not going to uh, continue to use the term. Um, so it doesn't make much sense for a, you know, quasi legislative uh, or quasi, you know, judicial body or legislative body or whatever you want to call a planning board, uh, but someone who's a, applying bylaws uh, to use a term in a bylaw that that a court, you know, which ultimately is going to look at what the planning board does potentially uh, is not gonna use. Um, the other part of it is uh, for reasons that I haven't bothered to go back and look at, uh, grandfather that is considered is listed in the definition section of the stormwater management bylaw and nowhere else. So it is defined and not used anywhere in the bylaws. So um, it's, it's somewhat useless as well. Um, so not that we're necessarily going through every bylaw to take out any useless. This happens to also be useless too. So uh, any comments or questions or anything else from planning board? That was my question, whether or not that word was used in the bylaw at all, because nope. it's not. I would say in our explanation, that's another reason why we're taking it out because it's not a use, used term. You gotta be careful, Marcus, because it, you can't be biased and you can't 
segregate it out. I think just leaving it, removing it because of state you legislation is requiring it. We have to write an explanation why we are removing it. That's what I'm saying. You have to add an explanation why we're removing it. Uh, but I, I guess my, my opinion is um, I, I'm removing it for the first reason. Um, okay. I, the fact that it's not being used is fine and all, but that's, you know, like I said, I'm sure there's other definitions and terms in the bylaws that are not being used that if we went through and found them, you know, it's just the process of amending things, uh, things get left in. But um, I, I'm not sure that's necessarily my primary reason, but um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to fight that much on that one. If you want to do it, that's fine. But, um, you know, I, I think it's, again, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, it, it's not a, it's not so much the issue of people using it because I don't think people use it in a, in a, in a, derogatory manner currently. I just think that, you know, when you are in this position applying the bylaws, you should be held to a thing where you're using terms that don't have that origin. I mean, it, 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 when you look back at it, that's clearly what it is. So um, there's not really any debate about it. Um, so, uh, and again, if the court's not going to use it, why should, why should we? So um, any other comments anything on it open up to public anybody in the public want to have any uh comments or questions okay <laughs> interesting all right so we'll uh do a roll call vote on it uh, do i hear a motion oh 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 uh, we gotta we gotta close the hearing right yeah. motion to close the hearing do i hear a motion to close the hearing Marcus Phelps, so moved. Richard Olsen, a second. Do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Olsen, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we'll do a, um, a, do I hear a motion um, to, um, I think of the terminology I got to use, uh, to, uh, to um, approve sending this to the town meeting for for voting. Does it go go back to the select board, but Doug or no? It goes to the it goes to the town attorney. Okay, all right. And then he they, might he might put a semicolon or change change the format because if you notice the article is blank at the top, and that's not going to be determined until all the articles are approved by the town attorney. Okay, no, that's fine. It just doesn't need to be. Um, uh, it doesn't need to go back to the select board to, for any sort of formality. It just goes to the clerk and they deal with whatever they, they have to do uh, with the town attorney. It's right. the select board's request to your request to send it to us for a hearing and then we put it on the warrant, I think is the actual process. Yes. So yeah, it is coming back to the board of selectmen from here. All right. So the go on a warrant. I mean, not that it matters all that much, no. but the motion should be to send it back to the select board to, to put it on the um, to put it on the warrant. <laughs> Do I hear such a motion? Marcus Phelps, so move. Do a second. Do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Singer, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. All right, that takes care of that. Hey, Michael. Yes. For the purpose of meeting minutes, what do you want me to write then? For the motion. Uh, motion to uh, um, remove the term grandfather. To back to the, the select board to put on the um, to put on the warrant. Put on the okay. town warrant. Okay. Hey, Mike. I got a text. The guy wanted to know if uh, we check with grandmother to make sure we could take out grandfather. Hey, you know, I'm just I'm running down the liberal agenda here. Uh, we've already taken care of Dr. Seuss. You know, <laughs> potato head done. Um, you know, grandfather, you guys, these are the important issues that you guys are not focusing on. Uh, you know, we don't care about, you know, uh, child poverty or health care. We care about these things. These are the important things, Dave. How about the title secretary? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> administrative assistant. You're right. <laughs> Aren't you not, you're not an administrative assistant? You're still technically a secretary? Yep. 
well, Ruth has Ruth did change the name of the select board. So uh, I saw that. <laughs> Actually, Ruth had changed her yes, title also. Did. She changed it to executive um, administrative. What was it, ma'am? Executive administrative assistant. Yeah. All right. All right. So can we change Megan's classification? Let's talk about that another night. We got way to do. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get, you know, there's so much Actually, more. It comes with a raise, too. So much more on the liberal agenda. Oh, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I, you know, I, next on mine is Donald Duck. He doesn't have pants. I mean, that's a front. <laughs> <laughs> I really think we should take that. That's, that's very important. <laughs> All right. Um, this one should be reasonably quick, I think, too. Uh, 745 consultant public hearing. What did I do with the notice? Mike, can you change the screen again? Thank you. Please, and keep Mike. Going. I did. I did attempt to. I'm going to keep forgetting. I did attempt to again to do a preliminary article. Yeah, where'd you get? The, did I send this to you, Alan, or did you get it from somewhere else? I um, I think I got it from someplace else, but you sent it to me also. Okay. All right. I think you got it out of MGL Chapter 44. Right. That's basically what I was looking for. So. Um, all right, um, so 745 consultant public hearing notices hereby given in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 11, that the Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, March 16, 2021 at 745 p.m. via Zoom on an application by the Southwick Planning Board to amend the Town of Southwick bylaws. The Planning Board proposes to add a bylaw allowing it to hire outside consultants when necessary for review on an application with consulting fees paid by the applicant. Zoom information is given. Copy of the application, the plans may be inspected by contacting the town planner, Alan Slessler at 413-569-6056 or his email address. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and manner designated the Michael Doherty Chairperson Southwick Planning Board. Okay. Um, let's pull this one up. And Anybody see that? Okay. Let me see if I can get most of it on the screen here. Uh, actually, I can take that. The first part is just the thing. All right. So uh, this is, so there is a, there is a, as you can see, a section of the general laws, which which talks about this process of utilizing consultants. Um, I've noticed a lot of towns uh, have just sort of referred to that section and, and use this similar language that Alan has pulled out here, which I think is, is good. Um, you know, it sort of sets up the process, gives authority, gives the logistics of, you know, a, a having an account that is set aside, which I think is required to be done. Um, you know, I trying to see if there was in here, I can't remember. Um, let's see. So, you know, the one thing I guess, um, that I wanted to bring up was whether in, you know, I, like I said, I generally like this bylaw, but whether or not we um, put in any language that sort of makes it a, you know, ha it has to be an important application or it has to be a technical application. I mean, so, you know, so that it doesn't get abused in some way. There has to be some sort of, you know, something that it meets um, before you can hire a consultant. Um, you can't use it just to sort of penalize a, an applicant. You sort of need it. You need to have sort of good faith when you're doing it. Um, I, I just don't know if there's a way to put that in or whether it it should be should be put in. But anybody have any suggestions? Well, there is an appeal process in the last paragraph. It seems like that's a, a way of... Uh, but that's about the selection, not about the actual requirement. 
That's like, about I who, think, um, who and not, and not, you know. Oh, for who it is, right. not whether, whether there is one yeah. selected. Correct. I think we, we should put, use it at any time we have a question or we're sort of all of our authority as to what needs to be done with the project. So we just need, this really protects us as a board. Yeah, and I don't, I, you know, I, I don't see there's there's a huge likelihood of abuse of it. I just didn't know whether it was something that, you know, there should be some limitation put in, you know, to make it more more narrow. Um, you know, I suspect you would use it on stuff, you know, like a cell tower or like, a, you know, well, you won't, you wouldn't need it on 315, but. Um, I think uh, you need guidance on it. Maybe, you know, you may, it may be something about a solar um, um, mm -hmm application that you would need someone on um you know i mean there just may be times where you need someone anything that we need any guidance on that's all that's all i'm thinking all right um could we um extend the appeal process to whether or not a consultant is even needed at all or if the i guess the applicant believes that the planning board has sufficient expertise in the area or that the Activity is sufficiently simple that it should be reviewed by untrained professionals, I guess. I don't know, Dave, because that way anybody could question our, our decisions. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I mean, it's on one hand, you've got that. On the other hand, I do understand. My, I mean, you know, I don't expect this planning board to run amok with this, but I could see where, you know, potentially it could or. Or make it so it's a universal decision by the planning board. It has to be everybody yeah. on board. Well, I mean, basically what you'd be doing, and I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong, but you'd be giving the select board a veto over your over the planning board selection of a you know consultant or the or the need for a consultant. Well, I hear what Dave Sutton's saying, uh, include some kind of a I don't know. Super majority vote required, or something to to do unanimous to, decision. Unanimous. Unanimous. Mm -hmm. This way, we'd have to talk about with each other why we, we would we want. We, mm -hmm. Not just because. Well, I just want to know. Well, not a question of just whether or not you want to know. I know there are times where I have to look things up for small stuff. It would have to be a unanimous decision that. there's something outside our scope of investigating it's not kind of to have this done especially with the cost of plywood going to 50 bucks a sheet already fortunately we we have we have a, a great tool on randy who's been doing most of most of the review along with myself and most of it is um not on a large scale i would say we would use something like this for an example if an Amazon were to come into town, you know, with a, a unbelievably a large area complicated, that's when you may want to get to apply this. But I don't think we have to apply it for every application we have, because the whole the whole system will slow down to nothing. I mean, I'm a little hesitant to make it unanimous. That seems like you're giving a lot of. I mean, if there's someone who just doesn't like a project or, or really does like a project, you know, um, they have the ability to to sort of derail the others. Um, that I'm not I'm not sure I'm on board with that. Uh, I think I'd be more inclined to allow an appeal to the select board, um, you know, with some language like you know whether it's being done in good faith or something like. That. Um, So uh, I wonder if there's anything out there that would already be in, you know, in, in text. Yeah, and I, don't, I mean, do, do people think we need it in there? I, I just wanted to raise it so that if, if people felt we needed that restriction in there, we'll put it in there. But, you know, again, I don't, I'm not seeing a huge... Well, there really isn't any anything in there that's set, you know, says how we would use it. No, I agree. I mean, it, it's it's. So I mean, you know, what would 
trigger the use? I mean, is it the chair that's deciding or uh, like David Sutton saying, it's a unanimous. I think there's something in between. It's called majority. Well, I, yeah, I assume if so would fall any, you know, if your planning board is authorized to do something, they have to do so by majority vote, I assume. But I, I, I guess it might be worth putting that specifically in there, but that's what I sort of assumed was the case. I would prefer to keep it within our, our control. All right. As a simple majority of the planning board finds that this particular application requires outside assistance, then that is what our should be. Do you think it should be a majority or a super majority? So three out of five or four versus five? Yeah. I say yeah. super. Super. I think I'm more, I think I'm okay with super because it, you know, yeah. it, it puts a little bit of a check in there um, to make sure that you're you're using it properly. Yeah, so that would uh, an, an appeal yeah. process wouldn't have hurt either, Mike. You know, we are talking about appealing to the selectmen on top of that, also. I, I mean, maybe, but if you put in language like "good," you know, that their only way that they can deny it is, you know, if they don't think the planning board is. I don't know. I, I'm I'm hesitant to give the select board a complete veto over, you know, for whatever reason they feel like. Um, <laughs> that that does not necessarily sit well with me. Um, not of course with this board, but uh, just in general, the yeah, process doesn't doesn't work well. Um, I mean, I think having a super- Pops mature, back on screen, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I, well, I mean, he would, he may just want Derek Jeter to look at stuff and, you know, we'd have to use Derek Jeter. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's a problem. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think the super majority is the check that's necessary. I, I, that's sufficient to sort of prevent people from, from abusing this. I think that's sufficient, but again, I, I'm happy to change it and, and add for discussion or add for vote something else. If people are thinking there should be an appeal process. Well, I think you could in, insert in the first paragraph uh, after authorized with a supermajority vote to retain la 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 la. Is everybody okay with just putting that in? Yes. It's just, it's, it's really got to be used as a last resort because, you know, dealing with these, these consultants can be extremely expensive in some cases. Well, it's paid, it's paid by the developer or the applicant. Well, yeah, I, I'm not talking about us paying for it. It's easy for us to spend somebody else's money. I'm talking about the developer, you know, whether it's a developer or a builder or whatever, they're still, they're still in the business to make money and to, and to, uh, to spend money unnecessarily is not good for them either. Just because we say they can doesn't always make it okay. No, I it'd agree. Have a, it'd, it'd have to be a good reason why. Um, I and that's why you, you trust in the board to, to make that right decision and right. See, I mean, I, I just, you know, I guess I think of it a little differently, Dave, where I'm not, you know, I find it, I'm, well, first of all, we already have the, uh, we already have the right, I think pretty unlimited under 315 to, to, to do this when there's a, a, a developer coming in, but you know, and, and I could see a situation if you were doing a large development where you may need some technical assistance on, you know, drainage or whatever, though we do have some pretty good resources in town currently um, for that purpose. But I, I'm not seeing, you know, your, your run of the mill builder or whatever else coming in in some way, you know, and we're gonna require an applicant. I mean, I, I think these are some pretty well funded applicants who are coming in where we may need a consultant, right? I mean, like I said, I, I'm thinking cell towers, solar, things like that, that may have a technical aspect to it that we just don't know about or have people in town that really know about. Um, that's more what I'm sort of envisioning. Sort of like getting, designing a dam to block Great Brook. 
you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's up to the town. That's when you would use an outside consultant like this. Yeah, I mean, it would, it would just, it, there's probably not too many times where you would need it, but I think it's useful to have as we, as we saw. I mean, it probably, I, I you know, I, I wasn't a voting member, but it, you know, having, having a radio frequency engineer offer their neutral opinion may have been useful um, in that Verizon application. And we can also use this because we're going to have to have a professional new our master plan. True. I you, Alan, I thought you were doing that. Uh, no, I'm not doing that. Well, but this would be, I'm not sure this would apply to that because this is for applications. That's not necessarily an application, but, um, um, but I, I think that would be more done on a, on a, on an RFP type of basis. Um, but, um, from the, from the, from the select board potentially, or I don't know, maybe it's from us. I don't know. Um, where were you going to put that majority or super majority? Where was that going to be placed? You know, it could be where Marcus, I, I you know, so probably somewhere in the beginning where they're authorized to do it by super majority vote or, you know, something like that. Right after the word authorized is authorized by a super majority vote. No, it's after retain. You got as authorized. After retain? Okay. Whatever. And what section can this go in under uh, 18540 planning board? I would leave that to the. Yeah, there, there's, that's why there's that term. It's at the top. The, the uh, town attorney will um, letter it and number it to fit into the town code. I think it's a new section, though. Yes. All right, any other board comments or questions? All right, any public comments or questions? Hey, Mike, this is uh, Randy. Yeah, Randy. Uh, so I think, you know, you guys noted, um, you know, between myself and Alan and others in town, I, you know, I, you know, certainly we have a lot of uh, experience and, and I think, you know, most projects certainly we can uh, review in-house. Uh, there's only a, you know, really, a, I think a, a narrow uh, selection of projects that, you know, we would probably want to have outside help reviewing. Um, but I did want to make one point in the last paragraph, you were talking about the appeal process yep. to the select board. And uh, so the way this is worded is the, the applicant can only appeal the decision for a consultant uh, based on um, you know, the, the starting the third paragraph is a uh, third line is uh, the grounds for such an appeal is limited to the claims that a consultant selected has a conflict of interest or does not possess the minimum required qualifications. So they can't appeal it because they don't agree with it or they don't want to pay for an outside consultant. So mm -hmm. I just want to make that point clear. Yep. Um, yeah, no, and really, I don't, I don't foresee it being used much at all, especially now. I mean, I do, you know, um, um, you know, plan for potential future issues when, when people aren't, you know, like yourself and Alan aren't in town and, and, you know, you don't have that source of, of guidance or, you know, whether it's time restraints or whether it's, you know, um, knowledge restraints of, of people in, who may fill in your position going forward. Um, you know, so, I mean, I think right now we're fine. I don't, I don't see any issue right now. I, I yeah, see. Yeah. No, yeah. No, Alan can never retire. That's, yeah. that's the, that's the bottom line here. So. Oh, it's coming soon. <laughs> oh, he can come back as a paid consultant. <laughs> there there you go. This is this really the whole goal of this was so that Alan can retire and come back. This as a, is, <laughs> Oh, I don't think I do that either. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, any other uh, comments or questions? Well, Mike, are you going to mark this up where you'd like that put? Yeah, I will. I'll, I'll okay. mark everything up and, and circulate them. Thanks. Um, no, you're true, because this one, um, yeah, and so we will put it after retain, because we can vote on this one now. There's no reason, I don't think, to continue this one. So, we'll put that by supermajority vote after retain. Um, I'll mark it up and send it to you, Alan. Okay. Um, all right. Do I hear a motion to close the hearing? Uh, Mr. Darity. Yes. So just real quick, just to echo what Randy said, 
<clears throat> first of all, we're blessed that we have Alan and Randy. And for 99% of the projects that come in front of us right now, I think we're the planning board is very well served with the resources we have in town. But if there was an outsized project that were to come in in the future um, and or, you know, we don't have the depth of resource we have today, I think this is a valuable tool. But I, the point that I would take away is that this is an, it shouldn't be ever used as a power to, to basically dismiss a project by burdening it with cost, which I think is what Dave is getting at, right? So, you know, someone comes in and they want to build, uh, they, they need a special permit to revamp a, a piece of property and, you know, reface a, some siding on a building and they need a, a special permit. And it's a business that they don't want, the planning board does, at the time doesn't want. So they elect to hire a consultant to have the plans reviewed and just to install, instill additional cost on a, on a developer or an applicant. And I don't think that's the intent here. I think this is more along the lines of the intent of the, under the subdivision control law, where you could have, you know, a, a many hundred acre development, commercial development or something like that, or even a solar plan that could be impactful on drainage and so on and so forth. And so you'd want to have somebody take a, look, a second set of eyes on those plans to evaluate it and give you an engineering analysis of those plans to make sure that what's drawn makes sense, right? So that's just my take on it. And, and the, the appeal, I did read the chapter 315, the appeal process. So I think what Dave was suggesting to have a super majority of the planning board to vote to have a consultant might work beneficially to that because then you need to get the super majority to even go out to an outside consultant. So that if some, you know, if, if you just get a couple of people that want to delay a project, that's not the way to do it. And, and that's not the intent of this bylaw and it, it, sh it should be promoted as such. And then, um, you know, the, as for the appeals, irrelevant to me, you know, those selectmen, you know, shady bunch of characters, I wouldn't want to go to them either. <laughs> but I get you. And um, so as, you know, as far as the, I think the, I was on when they put in that outside agency piece for the, the 315 and that was, there was concern about developing even the list of consultants because there was so few and, and therefore it was necessarily almost a competitor of the person who was submitting the plan on behalf of a developer. And there was concern that there'd be, you know, trying to tear up the plans of your competitor and make them look bad. And so there was the ability to select one of five or something from a list. And if you were aggrieved by the planning board selection from that list, you could go to the board of selectmen to get relief, but it wasn't relief to say that it was, you know, we don't want a outside review. Right. And I, you know, I, I agree with all that. And I, I do want to just say, you know, um, to echo what Randy said, I mean, I, I, again, I, I think you guys can do almost all of it. Um, I, I, I do at times, get concerned about putting too much on your plate. And I hope you guys are more, you know, than willing to, to speak up when, um, you know, things are coming in fast and furious um, because you guys do do um, a, a hell of a job providing us with that technical assistance. So, you know, especially as we're, you know, I think there's gonna be a number of developments and projects coming in down the pike here. So, you know, don't don't overburden yourself on on some of that. Hey, that's why they get paid the big bucks. <laughs> that's why we get paid the big bucks too. Um, um, all right. Anybody else have anything else to add? Okay. Uh, do I hear a motion to close the hearing? Marcus Phelps, so move. Richard Singer, I. Uh, do a roll call. Or Dick, you're seconding. Yes. Okay, um, do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Ossinger, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. Okay, uh, do I hear a motion to uh, refer this back to the select board to be put on the town warrant? Marcus Phelps will make that motion uh, to include the uh, revision of the text in the first paragraph. Right. 
uh, yeah, with the supermajority vote. Um, I'll second. I'll second. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Richard Otzinger, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. Okay. Um, all right. So that's all set. I was just trying to pull up the notice here for the next one. All right. So um, last one here. Um, Change your screen. Thank you. That's Dick's job. Oh, sorry, right. Dick. All right. Okay, so revision of bylaw for the stormwater management section. Um, notice of public hearing. Notice is hereby given in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 11, that the Planning Board will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, March 16, 2021, at 8 p.m. via Zoom on an application by the Southwood Planning Board and Department of Public Works to amend the Town of Southwood bylaws. The Planning Board and Department of Public Works proposes to amend Chapter 185 zoning, amend chapter 315, subdivision of land, and add a new bylaw to update stormwater regulations for new development and redevelopment projects in order to meet conditions required in the Massachusetts small MS4 general permit. Uh, information provided, a copy of the application and plans may be inspected by contacting the town planner, Alan Slessler at 413-569-6056, or his email. Any person interested or wishing to be heard on the application should appear at the time and place designated Michael Doherty chairperson. Southwick Planning Board. Ooh. All right. Um, hold on, let me get back to the screen here. Okay. So um, it's probably best, um, um, you know, I, I've communicated with Randy about this a little bit. I have a sense of what they're trying to do. Uh, but it probably makes more sense to have, I don't know if it's Randy or John who want to talk about it, but uh, if one of y'all want to give us a, you know, thumbnail about what's going to happen, that would be great. Yeah, I can talk and John can fill in. Uh, if, uh, can you help, uh, can I just, can I share my screen as well? I think that will help. Of course. Yeah. Let me, uh, not, not, let me, uh, hold on. Maybe maybe you could talk about the non-funded uh, uh, re requirements also. Yeah, so I'll give a quick introduction. Mandate. Yeah, I'll give a quick introduction here. So uh, there's a stormwater permit. Uh, you have seen several applications come across before planning board over the years, uh, where a developer has uh, proposing to disturb more than one acre of property, uh, and they're required to uh, get a permit. Uh, and is as one of that one some of the conditions is to uh, Minimize runoff, uh, minimize flow from up from that property, uh, promote um, infiltration or managing a stormwater on site. So that permit um, came into effect in 2004, or as a result of a permit from 2004 um, called the MS4 stormwater permit. So as a result of that 2004 permit, um, the town adopted the stormwater bylaw. And that was uh, put into place in section 36.1 of chapter 185 zoning. And so uh, recently in 2018, um, the MS4 stormwater permit was updated through Mass DEP and EPA. And there are several conditions in that permit. And one of those conditions is to update uh, the stormwater bylaw to account for some new standards. And that's kind of why we are here today. So a lot of the changes that we are going to talk about are required in the new permit. Um, there are also some changes that we're proposing to do uh, just because it's a convenient time to do this type of work when you're making other changes to a permit. So what I have is uh, this, this sheet here, mm -hmm. this page. You can all see this, right? Yep. Okay, yep. so there, there are seven... Uh, these are the seven most significant changes in the permit. Uh, and I, I, we'll go through the, per, the we'll go, I'm sorry, we'll go through the bylaw. We'll go through the bylaw in a minute here and go through page by page, page if you want to. Um, and and it, as we go through the bylaws, you'll see there's, it seems like there's a lot of changes. And, and yes, there are, but I think when you boil it all down, you're gonna find that pretty much, not, you know, about 95% of those changes 
are tied to one of these seven items that are that are on this page here in front of you. So we'll we'll talk about these seven items one by one. Uh, any questions? Uh, feel free to chime in, and then we can look at the the bylaw itself and the proposed changes. If I'm moving too quickly, or uh, you know, have any questions, feel free to chime in. I'm sure uh, this is the last thing you want to do is uh, you know at the 9:30 in the in the in the evening is is look at more bylaws, but we'll try to go through as quickly as possible here. So first item is move section 36.1 out of chapter 185 zoning and into a new general bylaw. So the reason we want to do this is uh, um, there may be some confusion uh, if the project uh, has to if a project is uh, disturbing more than one acre property, which would trigger the permit, but it's not triggering a zoning issue. Uh, there may be some confusion whether that permit would apply, and it, it does apply. The, the stormwater permit would apply, but there may be some confusion why. And I think the reason why it was put in zoning initially uh, in 2008 uh, was uh, where the, the DPW director at the time um, did not want to have anything to do with this with this new permit. So the enforcement of that permit uh, was through the building inspector. And I'm, I'm jumping ahead at myself, but if you look, if you look down at number six, we're changing the, the enforcement of this uh, stormwater permit from the building inspector to the DPW director. So I think the reason why it was put in zoning initially uh, was because the building inspector is also the zoning enforcement officer, and it made it was a convenient place to locate that permit. Um, I think at this time it makes sense to pull it out. There, uh, we probably put this under as a, a new a new uh, general bylaw. Um, and that way it's clear that any project um, would, could be, uh, this, this bylaw would, could potentially apply to any project. So that's the reason why we're looking for that, uh, that, that moving it out of, out of zoning. The next item is uh, renaming the bylaw. So the name of the current bylaw is, is Erosion and Sediment Control for Stormwater Management. And I think this really is a stormwater management bylaw. It's really a lot more than erosion and sediment control. So I think I think renaming it to stormwater management and erosion control makes makes much more sense. Uh, number three is delete the technical sections of the bylaw and incorporate them into a new Southwick stormwater regulation. So this is something that a lot of communities are doing. That what they're doing is they're taking the so the bylaw has all the sections related to the, uh, the enforcement and the process in which a permit is secured. And it also includes all the technical aspects. And what uh, most communities are doing um, are, is they are taking out the technical portion of the bylaw and adopting a separate stormwater regulation document. And the reason they do that is because the bylaw or the MS4 permit may change and that would require the town to adopt uh, to, to potentially new, uh, more strict standards, technical standards. And uh, if we could adopt those through the same process we are adopting them now, it would be done through the planning board, our review process, but it would have eliminate the step of have, having that review uh, go through uh, in front of town meeting. One issue that is on the table right now is there is a discrepancy between the permit, the MS4 permit, and the Wetland Protection Act. So we do know that the permit is going to change, and this could re happen relatively soon. Um, when the when Mass DEP and EPA drafted this permit, like I said, there was some, some conflicts between the Wetland Protection Act. There is a committee that's trying to resolve those discrepancies now, and uh, DEP has said that uh, there will be changes that may require another change to the bylaw. However, they're saying that, um, but the permit requires the town to adopt this bylaw by June 30th of this year, and they're not waiving in that requirement. There's, there's, so every community has to go through this process, and DEP is telling all of them that, uh, you know what, there's going to be some changes, but you can't wait until you know, make one, one global change. You have to do a partial change now and then and then some potential change later on. So what communities are doing to get around that is they're adopting this uh, this technical document uh, that's outside of the bylaw, but the bylaw references that document. The next item here is update the technical standards to meet them with the new MS4 permit. 
So one of the biggest items is the pre precipitation data. So the, the, the current permit refers to uh, what's called the technical paper 40, which is a document that was drafted in 1961. And it looked at rainfall events prior to that point. And that document has never been updated since that time. And uh, I, yeah, it's not a big secret that uh, rain events are happening more frequently and with more intensity. And uh, so when you're designing stormwater systems, you want to design them to accommodate, you know, current and future storms, not, not a, you know, an average storm that happened, you know, 60 years ago. So uh, most communities are moving towards this, uh, and actually DEP as well, they're moving towards this uh, NOAA Atlas 14 precipitation data. NOAA is, um, it's a federal agency and they, they adopt this uh, precipitation data uh, and it's based on real time. So they're constantly updating uh, the precipitation data as it's, uh, you know, I don't think update it once a year or every couple of years, but it's, it's updated frequently um, and, and, it, and it captures current rainfall data. So for reference, um, a 100 year 24 hour storm event, okay, that's the standard design event for stormwater systems. Under NOAA Atlas 14, it's 6.8 inches of, of rainfall. And I, I give plus or minus because, uh, you know, I guess, like I said, that's, that's ever, that's a re evolving. Uh, the, the TP40 document shows that as 6.5 inches of, of rain. So all the stormwater applications that you've seen in the past, um, they all have a, a design storm event of uh, 6.5 inches over a 24 hour period. That's going to change with a new with the uh, that's changing with this new permit. So you can imagine there's a pretty significant change uh, having design a, a, a stormwater system uh, to accommodate a six point or eight point six inch storm versus a six point five inch storm. So certainly there's going to be an impact to developers and homeowners uh, as a result of of that change. The next standard. Uh, that's being required is to promote low impact development. So I don't, if you're familiar with low impact development, think of green infrastructure, okay? Uh, rain gardens, porous pavement, uh, retention basins. Um, we don't have a lot of these in town now. I, I can't think of really too many. I know there is one, uh, there is a pr proposed rain garden that is under construction at a property at uh, 61 and 63 College Highway. It was a, uh, it's a two, it was one single lot that got broken up into two lots, uh, two single family house lots. And uh, so they're dealing with rain gardens uh, in that project. I do believe there's a project that's coming before you in a couple of weeks on 115 Fred Jackson Road. I think they are proposing a rain garden uh, to main of stormwater on that property. Uh, certainly green infrastructure is something that uh, Mass DEP and EPA are promoting. And uh, that's something that we're being required to promote through our bylaws. It's not required, but the developer and their engineer are required to evaluate whether uh, these types of uh, stormwater systems are, are applicable to their project. And the third technical standard is to update standards for total suspended solids, phosphorus, and nitrogen removal. So right now, the current regulations require 80% uh, suspended solids removal and 60% 60 phosphorus removal for new, new development. Uh, those, that standard is, is being changed. So it's gonna require 90% suspended solids removal and 60% suspend, 60 removal of phosphorus for new development. And item five is add a definition and standards for redevelopment. So the current bylaw speaks only to new development. And the language in the bylaw for redevelopment is really, it, 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 there's no specific criteria. It just says it's more of a blanket statement that uh, these projects, the redevelopment projects should, should improve stormwater controls on a property. There's no specific standards, uh, but, but now uh, there, is, there are standards for redevelopment projects. They are a little lower than the standard for new development, but the standards are written in there that they need to be met. Item six is change enforcement from building inspector to DPW director. We touched upon that earlier. 
Um, Kyle Scott, our building inspector, has, uh, you know, he, he's really involved in more in vertical construction, not necessarily horizontal construction. And stormwater is more of a horizontal, uh, horizontal construction issue. I think it makes more sense to have that authority under the DPW director. Uh, Kyle, Kyle Scott, our building inspector, uh, has uh, no issues with shedding that responsibility. Um, this is something that uh, he was aware of uh, when he took the job a year ago. This was uh, under discussion at that point. And the last bullet point here is just a reference. Uh, the, the bylaw references a 1997 document that was published by the state of Massachusetts. Uh, there is a new document from 2008 that uh, has replaced that 1997 document. And there's a references in the, in the bylaws about that. So we're just changing that at this point. And that said, I do expect that that 2008 document will be revised at some point, you know, probably in the near future. Um, any questions on these kind of like, these are the big ticket items. Uh, any questions on these issues before we go through uh, the pages of the, each bylaw? Yeah, uh, what's our time frame tonight, Michael? Are we going till 10 and that's it? Um, yeah, I was just, I, I think I was going to let Randy make his presentation so we can get that done. I expect he'll be done before 10. Um, and, um, you know, if there was a few little questions or, you know, bigger ticket questions, maybe get those off uh, and then let people process this, you know, and, and continue it to the next hearing to sort of make a decision because it's a lot to process. So I think Kevin, and we have the time, you know, we can, we can, deal with it at the next meeting. Um, so I think giving people time to process it and if there's other little things that come up, you know, Randy can address them, you know, either through email uh, in the meantime or at the next meeting. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. And, and if you have any questions, you know, over the next couple of weeks and you yeah, feel free to reach out to me directly and we can talk about them. And that way, you know, you have an answer prior to the meeting. Um, I have so no, Mike, no issue doing that. So Michael, we can share Randy's uh, notes with his, his, his underline to the board members now so they can have time to absorb what's in it. Yep, you can do that. And, you know, I just, uh, I'll let Randy go through what he, he's saying, but I just want to make clear because it's at least where my head went when I first talked to him about it. I mean, it things are getting moved, but at the end of the day, um, the planning board retains control over both the bylaw as well as the regulations. Um, and, you know, which I think is important from a structural standpoint where you have, you know, elected officials who are, who are in charge of it and ultimately answer to, you know, any issues with it um, versus putting it in, in the, in the hands of someone who's, um, you know, employed by the town. Um, and, but it, it, you know, it makes sense to me to sort of be more fluid and put something in regulations like we have with 315, where, you know, you can, you can amend those as needed without going to town meeting that this just seems like a, 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 a area that, that needs that sort of flexibility. But go ahead, Randy, if you want to go through the yeah, thank you. That's a that's a good point. Yeah. There, so from from planning board standpoint, I, I really don't think your role in this whole process is changing uh, really one bit. Um, you're still the application is still going to come before your board. You still have the authority to review and and approve of those or deny those those those, those uh, projects. Um, so let me go through the bylaw. Can everybody see this now? Just popped up on here. Uh, no, it's still the old. It's still the. Um... Okay. You still have the number. You still have one through seven. You yeah. still okay. Summary let me that. let me try this again here. Let's yep. see here. Yep. How's that? Is that better? Yep. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. So I did this document and track changes. I copied the original bylaw into a word document. Then everything that you see in red is uh, either a, a new change or a new addition or the strikeouts. So the very beginning here, we talked about uh, changing the, the name of the regulation and moving it into a new section number. So that's what we're showing here, section XXX. That's something that the lawyers can decide where that fits best. Uh, stormwater management and erosion and sediment control. 
period. So as I go through this document here, move. I'm gonna move, uh, here we go. I had to move all the pictures here so I can move. All right, so as I go through this document, you can see the, the changes here in red. Um, we're talking, you know, end redevelopment. You're gonna see this uh, quite, quite often where your original um, permit reference development, and now that we're adding uh, provisions and, and standards for redevelopment, we're gonna add language uh, such as this, you know, where it says development and redevelopment or, or, or redevelopment. So that's what those changes are in paragraphs one and two. Let's do this. Okay, section B authority. This is uh, the change from the public uh, change, the, the enforcement from the building inspector to the public works director. And then in the last paragraph here, we just did a, a change in Ruth's honor uh, changing it from select board of selectmen to select board. We do have some uh, definitions that are going to be revised and some that are going to be eliminated uh, because some of these uh, definitions are no longer in this bylaw. They are referenced in the, the, the separate uh, uh, Southwick, stand, uh, Southwick uh, handbook document. So that's why they're taken out of uh, the bylaw. Um, first of all, the authority again, that's DPW director. This paragraph on our best management practices, again, that is the, the, the revised um, uh, reference to the new handbook, the 2008 document, as opposed to the 97 document. This uh, definition for design storm is no longer in the bylaw. We're taking that out as well as dry well, flow attenuation, and then uh, we have the grandfather. Uh, I was thinking, uh, Mike, you know, I know you have your own bylaw for to remove the, the grandfather definition. I think it makes sense to, you know, you still proceed with that bylaw change and then we'll proceed with this bylaw change. Um, I, I could see the lawyers saying that uh, um, if say the, the, the stormwater bylaw did not get approved at town meeting, at least you would still have the ability to have it removed through that separate bylaw. Right. There's so, no there's no harm in doing it twice. Yeah, no harm in doing exactly. So we'll keep that, we'll keep that, remove that. We have a new definition for new development, and that is taken directly from the MS4 permit. And it basically states that any construction activities uh, disturbing uh, equal to or greater than one acre um, are, are, are covered under this bylaw. One thing that I will point out, and I'm not, not that I'm uh, advocating for it, but uh, the one acre is, uh, is up for discussion. Uh, there are some communities that are actually uh, requiring this bylaw for uh, disturbances that are less than one acre. I think Wilbraham is one that uh, has set a standard of 10,000 square feet or basically a quarter of an acre uh, that um, would require a stormwater permit. So I just want to throw that out there. Uh, that's something that we can discuss if the board would like to. Uh, like I said, I'm not advocating for it. I think one acre is a, is a fair threshold and I think most communities are going to stick, stick with that one acre. Mm -hmm. But uh, certainly there, there are some communities that are, that are going more strict than that. We have a couple more definitions here for post-construction impervious surface area, redevelopment and site. Uh, these are all taken directly from the uh, MS4 stormwater permit. Again, we have uh, this uh, new uh, reference for new redevelopment added into this start of construction uh, paragraph. And uh, going to paragraph D applicability, we've got uh, two locations again where it is uh, adding redevelopment. This paragraph F, uh, widening of other improvements. So this, these are these are uh, projects that would be eligible for a stormwater permit. And uh, this, again, this widening or other improvements to an existing roadway that increase the amount of impervious area by the redevelopment site greater than one single lane width. 
that is taken right from the MS4 permit. Um, if there, so there was some discussion as the permit was being drafted about, say the town wants to repave a road or if a, a, um, a, a uh, say a, a, a supermarket wants to repave their parking lot, uh, whether that, that those types of projects would be eligible or exempt. So that's being clarified through that, that definition there. Paragraph two, we're eliminating the building inspector and building department. Okay, in this paragraph E, this is where we are bringing in the, the new handbook, the local handbook, the, which you're calling the Southwick Stormwater Regulation Handbook. Uh, and uh, that's where the um, technical standards are going to be um, listed. Uh, moving on to this paragraph, subparagraph D, again, new development and redevelopment. Um, and again, paragraph F is an exemption for projects related to uh, widening less than one single lane. So it kind of ties into the paragraph we talked to above about uh, uh, projects that involve street, street, street paving or, um, site or um, parking lots. This paragraph F is uh, referring to our new stormwater regulation um, and saying that it's here, hereby incorporated by reference into the document, into the bylaw. Uh, paragraph F2, this is, I added this new paragraph here at the very end here, the sentence, uh, which basically states that the planning board has the authority to amend South stormwater regulation uh, under your responsibility to establish a mass general law. And uh, so that is, uh, that's how you, we're not losing uh, planning board's authority over the regulation itself. Uh, this paragraph theory again, just talks about the, the new regulation um, that we're adding here. Okay, paragraph two, application requirements, new or redevelopment. Um, that's, we talked about that. I did add this one, item here about have, having three paper copies and one electron, electronic copy submitted for the application. You can see the way it was written originally as just three copies. So this day and age, everything we like to have electronically is that's why we're adding that. Uh, there are some subsection changes here. Um, new development or redevelopment once again, eliminating the building department. Again, if I'm going too quickly, just chime right in. Uh, all of these changes here, uh, again, refer to our local regulation uh, as opposed to the technical section in, uh, in the original, in the current bylaw. Paragraph six inspections. Again, we're taking that uh, authority away from the billing department and that's gonna be through the uh, director of the DPW. Just have some section changes here. From review fees not changing. So this paragraph B, engineering and consultant review fees, this ties into the discussion that we just had um, for uh, outside consultants. I copied these paragraphs, I think it's just one through five. Uh, I think I copied them th from 315. Um, what I should probably do is copy the language that I should either refer to the doc the bylaw which you're adopting, uh, which you just approved to adopt or, or copy that word for word in this document. Um, I don't know if that makes a difference, Mike. Should I just reference that new bylaw? I don't, I mean, it, you know, we have, we have one in 315, so I don't, you know, whether you choose to do this, you know, individually or refer to the other one is sort of up to you. I don't really have a huge reference. I mean, I would say in the next two weeks before the next meeting, maybe take a look at that other one and see which one makes more sense in your mind for this particular, you know, type of permit, but um, you know, I don't, it, it's going to be a wash. I think they both pretty much allow the same, same thing. Yep. That's fair. I can do that. 
Okay, paragraph H, stormwater management and erosion control. Again, we have this new development or redevelopment uh, references to our local handbook. I did want to beef up some information in this document here. Uh, this is talking about minimum requirements required, um, or minimum information required in the in the design. Um, talking about topography, in particular, and watershed areas, especially when we're looking at green infrastructure, it's very important to know what types of soils we have and the watershed areas. Um, there is some reference to. Uh, beefing up information requested for the soil conditions as well later on, but that's really tied into uh, what you know what we'll, information that we're looking for when we review a project, trying to uh, utilize uh, green infrastructure and, and you know other low impact developments. So I kind of jumped again again here, but that's what this paragraph R is referring to is a summary of soil conditions. Uh, soil tests shall be conducted uh, where needed uh, for LID techniques. Like I said, it, it is very important to know what the soil conditions are uh, before, these, before evaluating uh, which, which low impact development is most suitable because not all of them are going to work in every situation. Uh, again, these are, so paragraph S is flow time calculations, hydraulic calculations. These are, um, things that will help us uh, you know, as we're doing the review, uh, looking at the, the low impact development and seeing what, what works best. And then uh, there's just a paragraph you with, there's a, there's a checklist from MassDEP that we asked the, the consultant to develop. So this paragraph I, you can see we've uh, del deleted this. This, this, is, uh, or this was the technical section of the document of the bylaw. So we're gonna re remove this and replace that with the new document and we'll get to that in a little bit here. I don't wanna to go too fast. All right. So again, we're renaming some paragraph numbers to accommodate that eliminated paragraph. Uh, we're talking here about references to the local handbook. Post-construction requirements, this I thought was very important to add. Uh, the permit itself does state that as-built plans shall be submitted to the town no later than two years after completion. That language was not in our current bylaw, so I added that in this, in this uh, paragraph here. Uh, in this paragraph two, operation maintenance inspection, again, uh, I'm just talking about which, which uh, departments have authority. Uh, it's not just the town, uh, but it's really planning board, water department, conservation building, health agent. We all have uh, a role in reviewing these projects. Uh, let's see here. So th this I thought was also something new to add. I thought that was important. Talk about maintenance agreements. So it's, it's one thing to uh, look at a project and, and review it. And, uh, and everything all looks great. Yeah, that's a great design. We love, we love what, you look, what you're planning on doing and, and, and have the developer install it. Uh, but it's another thing to actually maintain that, that system. And so I think, I think that's one thing that we're lacking right now is, is the ability to kind of force property owners to not only, you know, uh, well, force them to, to maintain these systems because if they're not maintaining a stormwater system, it's really not doing any good. So what we're looking to do here is add language that uh, there must be some language in their, uh, in their permit, or sorry, in their, in their application uh, regarding operation and maintenance of, of that stormwater system and how it's gonna be maintained uh, in perpetuity, not just through them, but say if they sell the property, there needs to be some type of uh, mechanism where the new property owners are aware of uh, that stormwater system and how it should be maintained. So that's what we're looking to do add in these paragraphs D and E is uh, to make sure that those systems are being maintained properly down the road. Okay, uh, so this was uh, just limiting the health agent. Uh, they're not involved in, uh, in uh, violations. So we've taken them out. 
Paragraph C here talking about uh, records and installation of maintenance. Um, these are maintenance logs. So again, talking up, going to the, what we just talked about is, is making sure that uh, these devices mm -hmm. and stormwater systems are being maintained. Uh, we are asking for an, an annual submission of a, uh, or some kind of a document that indicates what, what, what uh, actions were taken, whether they were repairs or inspections on those devices uh, once a year. So that, and then those inspections repairs should be in accordance with whatever operation maintenance plan that they, that they, they approved upon. So again, that kind of goes towards the, you know, like I said, making sure these, these uh, systems are being maintained properly. Taking out building department, um, new and redevelopment, a couple times here. And let's see here again, uh, nod to Ruth here, changing select board or changing to select board from the board of selectmen. And I think that's the last change here. So that's all of chapter 185. Is there any, I know I went through that very quickly. Um, any questions on that? Randy, I think it's very well done and it's uh, certainly something you know, that we can look at that's very specific as to what you're proposing. So I, yeah. uh, I think it's great. Okay, thank you. And let Randy, me do, let any me, more questions? So let me just, um, you know, my suggestion just because of the time, and I know you were gonna hop over to the regulations, I think, right? Is that where you're gonna yeah, go? Yeah, yeah, I would, yep, um, I, I can. Two things with that. One is I would, I would defer that to the next meeting um, just because of the time, I think, you know, that we'll have more time at the next one to just go through them. If people could read them in the meantime, um, and if they have questions, they can reach out to you. But, you know, I also wonder, um, for simplicity's sake, when you're going to town meeting, whether it is of more use to simply just say you are taking out that section and putting it into regulations and then we can deal with the tweaks to regulations at a at a later time it doesn't you know it may be too much information that you're presenting at town meeting versus something that we can simply just do outside of town meeting um but i you know i'll leave it up to you i just you know i was thinking through that as you were just talking about that and it's like well i'm not you know you have a lot of changes in the regulation section that's something that we can handle. Um, you know, the town doesn't necessarily need to see all the ways you're going to change that old section I or whatever it was. Um, you know, in the regulations. But yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we can uh, let's mull it over the next couple of weeks, and we can uh, talk about that at the next meeting. Yeah, okay. certainly, I certainly, uh, but I think that's uh, I, that's one is, is a good path moving forward. Okay. All right. So with that, um, I will continue this. Uh, I'll ask for a motion to continue. Uh, actually, well, oh, don't we have to work, Craig, um, you know, the Shell gas station in somewhere there also, Michael. Okay, well, hold on one second. Be because people are, I don't know if there's anybody on the meeting besides um, us here, but um, if there's anybody, public comments, if there are people here tonight who wanted to make a public comment, I'll, I'll certainly let that uh, happen. Okay. Um, so, um, what, uh, what do we have to do with the Shell gas station? Well, they're coming in for a site plan modification to uh, add um, more cold storage along well, Industrial well, Drive. You had that at the beginning of next meeting, didn't you, Michael? No, that was 115 Fred Jackson, which we've already advertised for. Oh, okay. It was, it was yeah. advertised in the paper twice for 710. Correct, correct, Megan. Right, I think you said that before. Seven ten, and then we have one at seven twenty now. Right, the um, solar, seven forty five for the signs. I told yes. you to put something in between seven twenty and seven forty five. Right, uh, that's the Fred Jackson. No, no, no. Fred Jackson is going to be first. What did I tell you to put between seven twenty and seven forty five? Uh, nothing yet. I so thought you said where, to put that project. I thought you said right, to put Samuelson, Samuelson at that point. Samuelson yeah. there. Samuelson's going to go there? College Highway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then uh, 745 is the, what I say? The sign. The sign bylaw. 
And and then we we got rid of grandfather and a consultant engineer. So and now it will just be re up Randy's uh, application. So just put the shell at like eight o'clock and put Randy's at you know eight ten. So college is the eight o'clock. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I you know. I hope you're okay with that, Randy. I just like to, you know, when the, with the single applicants, I just like to get them in and out if I can. No, that's fine. That's I appreciate that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so you're putting Randy, you're putting Randy in at um, put him in at eight ten. Eight ten. Nine nine thirty. <laughs> <laughs> but next next time he comes here with the disc golf seven ten. He's he's, <laughs> he's right there. He's number one. Hmm. Um. All right, so um, do I hear a motion to continue this public hearing until uh, 8.10 on March 30th? You're muted, uh, Marcus. Thank you. Marcus Phelps, so moved. Second. Anyone? We lost, lost, we lost Dick. No. I'll oh. second. Uh, Spina, all right, there you go. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. Sutton, you're up. Sutton's muted too. Aye, aye, aye. Oh, we got it. <laughs> it's getting late. Aye, 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 aye. <laughs> Dave Spina, aye. Jessica Thornton, aye. I tried muting Randy, but it wouldn't work. You wanted to mute yourself so you didn't hear the snoring. My wife can't do that either. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going down that road. Uh, all right. So uh, I think we're all set. And I think with the hour, we will defer on minutes and whatever else, unless there is some distinct emergency that we need to deal with right now. All right. Mr. Sutton. I make the motion to close the meeting. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Michael Doherty, aye. Marcus Phelps, aye. David Sutton, aye. Dave Spina, aye. Jessica 